The scene begins with a pink-haired boy awakening in an unknown place, groaning in pain and disorientation. He wonders if someone had attempted to bury him, but upon trying to open his eyes, he realizes that he can see through the coffin. This surprises him, and he decides to look around his surroundings. He notices many people, including a brown-haired girl, standing near the burial site where he was being interred. Two individuals were in the process of burying him. One of the two people digging the grave approaches the brown-haired girl, telling her that she need not have come alone and that they could take care of the matter themselves. However, the girl silences him and thinks to herself that she needed to make sure that the boy was indeed buried so that she could find peace of mind. In this scene, the pink-haired boy introduces himself as Jiang Chun and reveals that he was considered a fool in eight villages for eighteen years. However, his life changed when he was brought into the Gu family and married Miss Guan Qi. The reason for this was that an old Taoist had predicted that Jiang Chen's date of birth could cure Guan Qi's illness. Jiang Chen explains that after the wedding, Guan Qi deceived him with her fake care, and once she recovered, she poisoned him. To make matters worse, the Gu family agreed to this because they did not want to admit that a fool was their son-in-law. As Jiang Chen lay dying, a powerful spirit had fallen to earth and was attempting to take over his body, but it was accidentally absorbed by him. Jiang Chen asserts that in God's eyes, he is not only alive but also not foolish. Jiang Chen expresses his anger towards the Gu family and Guan Qi, vowing to make them pay for what they have done. In this scene, Guan Qi is waiting for a man named Sha Bai, who arrives in a car. Sha Bai is the general manager of the Ding Feng group and the direct heir to the Sha family. Guan Qi calls him, Brother Bai, and Sha Bai asks her if, it, is done. Soon, it's revealed that Sha Bai had something to do with Jiang Chen's apparent death. Sha Bai expresses his disdain for Jiang Chen, calling him a dog, and Guan Qi reassures him that she will declare to the world that Jiang Chen died of illness. Sha Bai is relieved and indicates that their wedding can now be prepared faster. However, his true motivations are revealed when he thinks to himself that he needed financial funds from the Gu family due to recent crises in the Ding Feng group. He admits that he would not want to marry a married woman otherwise. As Sha Bai and Guan Qi start to be physically inside the car, Jiang Chen unexpectedly emerges from the place where he was buried, surprising the two people who were burying him. They mistake him for a ghost. Xiao Bai and Guan Qi are completely taken aback and frozen with shock to see Jiang Chen alive and standing in front of them. Jiang Chen, on the other hand, seems to be calm and composed as he greets them casually. Hello, are you having fun? Despite being questioned by Xiao Bai and Guan Qi as to how he could possibly be alive, both of them are still in a state of disbelief and consider Jiang Chen to be a ghost. With a sly grin on his face, Jiang Chen pulls Xiao Bai out of his car and hurls him onto the ground, relishing in the sight of his enemy's humiliation. Playing with my wife? He he, he sneers, a hint of menace in his voice. Jiang Chen then turns his attention to another foe, Guan Qi, whom he had previously buried alive. With a swift motion, he digs up the spot where Guan Qi had been interred and tosses her and Sha Bai into the pit together. Those two plead for mercy, but Jiang Chen is not one to show mercy to his enemies. Killing you would only soil my hands, he declares. I'll deal with you using cheap tricks and then I'll call the reporters so that everyone in this city knows what kind of scum you are. As he walks away from the scene, Jiang Chen's thoughts turn to a mysterious soul that he has recently absorbed. Through this soul, he has gained access to the memories of a powerful entity known as Xiang Tianzun. In these memories, he sees a world teeming with monsters and fierce warriors, and he learns of the many extraordinary techniques, medical skills, enchantments, and alchemy that Xiang Tianzun had mastered. Despite the wealth of knowledge that he has gained, Jiang Chen knows that he will need to rely on his own spiritual energy to practice these techniques. As the morning sun rises over the horizon, Jiang Chen awakens from a restful night's sleep. Despite feeling comfortable and well-rested, he realizes that the spiritual energy in the surrounding mountain range is extremely thin, which may hinder his cultivation practice. However, Jiang Chen is not one to be discouraged by such setbacks. With a fierce determination in his heart, he proclaims, But since God won't let me die, then I, Jiang Chen, will surely live this wonderful life. Meanwhile at Jiang Chen's home, a group of unwelcome visitors arrives at his home. They demand payment of a large sum of money, 100,000 yuan, and give Jiang Ruo, his 16-year-old sister, a deadline to repay the debt. Jiang Ruo pleads for more time, but the visitors are adamant that they want their money back. The situation takes a darker turn when a red-haired man suggests that Jiang Ruo pay the debt with her body if she cannot come up with the money. However, Jiang Ruo resists this vile suggestion with all her might. Just as the red-haired man is about to make his move, he suddenly gets kicked from behind, and it's none other than Jiang Chen who has dealt a blow. 
Jiang Chen's eyes burn with fierce rage as he confronts the men who have dared to threaten his family. Let's see who dares to touch my sister, he declares, his voice ringing out with a confidence born of his formidable strength and unwavering courage. People were surprised to see that Jiang Chen had a different personality. Chen challenged the bully to come together if they wanted to fight him. One of the bullies called him an idiot and said that it wasn't against the law if he killed them. This made a red-haired man yell at Jiang Chun and threaten him for not thinking he had to pay. Jiang Chun said he would pay the money. The bullies were shocked to hear this because Jiang Chun only had three days to pay. Bullies threaten Jiang Chen's sister if he doesn't pay them money. Jiang Rua shares his concern with his brother, Chen, about the situation. Despite being away for some time, Chen empathizes with his family's plight and offers reassurance. Chen asks why they have so much debt, and Jiang Ru explains that their father was angry and sick after being kicked out of Gu's family when they tried to visit Chen. Having no money, they borrowed 3,000 yuan from Gurdin, but the interest rate kept increasing, and the debt ballooned to 100,000 yuan. The bullies are now after their family to pay the debt, which has put them in danger. Jiang Chen shows his determination to take care of his family in their time of need. He recognizes the gravity of the situation and is willing to take on the responsibility of earning money to help his family pay off their debt and support their father's treatment. Jiang Chen's father, however, expresses his skepticism about the situation, as he believes that their financial situation is so dire that treatment may be impossible without money. Nonetheless, Jiang Chen remains steadfast and committed to finding a solution, assuring his family that they can count on him to take care of things. Jiang Chen has just used his healing powers to help his father feel better leaving him feeling more youthful and comfortable. Chen's mother is surprised by this sudden turn of events and questions her son about what's happening. Chen reassures her that he will explain everything when the time is right, and he proceeds to check both of their health. In the next scene, Jiang Chen is at the Rukang group, and he discusses the company's history with his companions. The group has been in competition with the Gu family for decades, but they have always lost. Jiang Chen sees an opportunity to ally with the Rukang group since the enemy of his enemy is his friend. He decides to start with this group to achieve his goal of earning money to pay off his family's debt. Jiang Chen enters the Rakan group looking for Fang De, the chairman of the company. However, upon arrival, he is greeted by a receptionist who seems surprised to see him. Suddenly, a brown-haired man arrives and recognizes Jiang Chen as the son-in-law of the Gu family who was recently kicked out for allegedly molesting someone's nanny. The brown-haired man warns the receptionist to be careful and tells Jiang Chen to leave. However, when two bodyguards try to attack him, Jiang Chen uses his strength to knock them away with a single punch. Jiang Chen's unwavering determination and confidence are evident as he confronts the group of bodyguards blocking his way to see Fang De, the chairman of Rakan Group. Despite their threats and attempts to intimidate him, Jiang Chen remains unfazed and resolute in his goal. When the bodyguards attack him, Jiang Chen's impressive fighting skills are on full display as he effortlessly dispatches them with just one punch each. This demonstration of his physical prowess leaves both the brown-haired man and the receptionist in shock and disbelief, questioning how this, fool, could be such a skilled fighter. As the bodyguard trembles with fear, he exclaims in a trembling voice, You! Stay away from me! His heart races with anxiety, as he looks upon the imposing figure before him. Jiang Chen, however, remains undeterred by the bodyguard's outburst and reiterates his demand with a firm voice. I told you, I want to meet Fang De. The receptionist, sensing the urgency of the situation, acquiesces to Jiang Chen's request with trepidation. Yes, yes, I will call him immediately. After placing the call, she informs Jiang Chen of the chairman's request. Sir, the chairman has asked you to go up to the top floor first. Without hesitation, Jiang Chen makes his way to the top floor where he is greeted by a woman with brown hair. Her eyes lock onto his as she asks, Are you Mr. Jiang? Please follow me. As Chen follows the lady, he can't help but think of her body and how he wishes she was wearing a uniform skirt. He then suddenly uses a skill that allows him to see underneath clothes and remarks that Xiang Tianzuin, the mysterious soul within him, really knows how to play as he possesses such a skill. The lady then notices Chen's nosebleed and asks if he is okay, to which Chen brushes it off and continues towards Feng De's office. Upon entering, Feng De comments on how Chen doesn't look like an idiot as everyone says he is. Chin gets straight to the point and offers a way to help Feng De's company surpass the Gu Group and become the number one pharmaceutical giant in Xi'an Xuan City. Feng De is surprised and asks what Chin is relying on and what he wants in return. Chin confidently asks for 100,000 yuan once everything is done and requests to borrow Feng De's lab for an hour. Feng De orders the brown-haired lady, Xiao He, to take Chin to the lab and make the necessary arrangements. 
Chin went into the lab and fell asleep. The lady with brown hair asked if they should call security, but Feng De said no and told her to watch. When Chin woke up, he said he slept well and it was time to start working. After a while, Chin said he was done and they should look at the results. Feng De questioned if that was all they were relying on and asked about the effects of the medicine. Chin said it could get rid of scars, whether old or new. The lady accused Chin of bragging and said it only took him five minutes. Chin pulled her down on the sofa and told her to be quiet while he poured the medicine on her wound. The lady was astonished as she felt a comfortable warmth and exclaimed, It's so hot and comfortable. What's happening? Ah, uh, did the wound really disappear? It's really gone. Fang De, who was with her, was also amazed and said, Did such a long scar really disappear in an instant? Chin confidently suggested testing his ointment with more people if Fang De was unsure of its efficacy. However, Fang De declined to work with him, causing Chin to express his surprise and disappointment. Chin then decided to find someone else to work with, but his plans were interrupted by Guan Qi's sudden appearance. Guan Qi accused Chin of stealing confidential information from the Gu group and gave him two choices, hand over the scar removal, prescription, or go to jail. Chin smiled and asked if Guan Qi was accusing him of stealing from her house. Guan Qi didn't care and gave Chin a chance to hand it over and live peacefully since they were married. The woman with brown hair addressed Chin and exclaimed, So the medicine is stolen. I really misjudged you. Fonda then spoke and expressed his surprise. Jiang Chin, I never thought you would do such a thing. Guan Qi interrupted, reminding everyone that time is precious, and handed Chin a card with a password and 500,000 yuan in it, stating that it would be enough for his family to live a comfortable life. However, Chin threw the card away and expressed his disgust, saying, Your Gu family's money, that's disgusting. If you say that I stole the recipe, then you can read out the recipe and listen to it. Guan Qi's family lawyer, Fen Jian, then suggested that they let the police handle the situation, to which Guan Qi agreed, saying that Chen would go to jail. Instead of replying to their threats, Chen spoke to the lawyer and asked if he had ever taken medication for kidney deficiency, stating that he could cure it. The lawyer was surprised to hear that he could be cured, and Chen then asked Fang De for permission to use his lab again, which Fang De agreed to. As he was heading toward the lab, Chen told them to behave nicely and wait, and the lawyer asked Guan Qi if they really had to wait for Chen. After some time, Chen returned with the medicine he had made and assured everyone not to be surprised when they saw the results. He poured the medicine into the lawyer's mouth and instructed him to drink it, assuring him that it was not poison when he asked. After drinking the medicine, the lawyer exclaimed, Wait! This feeling! I actually feel healthier? Huh! My body actually feels cured! Fan Jian exclaimed in surprise. That medicine really has a miraculous effect? Chen then teased Guan Qi and asked if she would still accuse him of stealing from her family. Guan Qi, feeling embarrassed, admitted that Chen had won this time and gave him some advice, saying that one's talent could make others envious. Chen responded by saying that he found it interesting and wanted to see who would dare to fight him. Guan Qi and the lawyer then left the scene. The lady with brown hair expressed her admiration for Chen, saying that she didn't misjudge him. Fang De also felt embarrassed and admitted that he had been blind before, mentioning the cooperation that Chen had offered. However, Chen interrupted him, saying that they were no longer suitable for cooperation. Chen then asked Fang De why Guan Qi knew he was there, and that he had created a new medicine. Fang De was afraid and tried to calm Chen down, suggesting that they could be friends and that Rakan Group would be willing to buy Chen's products at double the price if he had any new research in the future. Jiang Chen said that he would discuss it later and began to leave while Fang De chased after him. However, Jiang Chen left without looking back. Chin is sitting on a bench in the city and thinking about the blockade set up by the Gu family. He reflects on how he was rejected by another pharmaceutical company after leaving Rakan Group. The city police sent by the Gu family had even blocked the stalls in the square. Chin realizes that he needs to take action. Suddenly, he sees the news on the billboard about the return of Miss Mu Shushue, the daughter of the most affluent group in the city, after her trip to South Africa. Chen seems to be happy after hearing the name and thinks about the Xinxian Group, a big company in Xianchuan City. He believes that the Gu and Rikang groups are nothing in front of it. Chen thinks that if he can reach Mu Shushue, the other matters can be solved. As Chen was lost in his thoughts, a group of people suddenly approached him and threatened him to hand over the secret medicine recipe. One of them gave him a three-second ultimatum to comply, while the other threatened to kill him on the spot. In response, Chin punched one of them and sent him flying in a single blow. He then warned them to go back and inform the Gu family that he is not afraid of them and is waiting for them to come back any time. 
The bullies ran away in fear from Chen's display of strength. Chen was practicing his cultivation techniques in a mountainous area when he realized that he needed to use celestial measuring techniques to locate Mu Shushue. He explained that this technique could spy on the will of heaven and help with prophecy and past and present life, making it useful for finding people like Mu Shushue. Chen started to search for Mu Shushue using this technique and after some time, he was able to locate her. Chen found Mu Shushue and positioned himself directly in front of Mu Shushue's car to make it stop. Chen then faked being hit by the car. Spectators who witnessed the incident expressed outrage, saying that the driver of the luxury car showed a disregard for human life. The bodyguard of Mu Shushu arrived on the scene and told the people to move out of the way so that medical staff could attend to the injured person. However, Chen stopped them and demanded that Mu Shushu's manager come out, criticizing her for driving recklessly. People who were present near the road started shouting at the owner of the car, expressing their anger and frustration. They called for immediate action to be taken to address the situation warning the owner that they would be held responsible in the future if they failed to do so. They accused the owner of hitting someone and not taking responsibility for their actions. Upon hearing the commotion, Mu Shushue, who was in the car, got out and approached Chin. When Chin saw Mu Shushue, he found her so attractive that he couldn't control himself and thought to himself that she was his future wife. Mu Shushue approaches Chin and asks how he is and if he is seriously injured. However, Chin doesn't respond and instead keeps looking at Mu Shushue. Suddenly, a red-haired girl appears behind Mu Shushue and claims that she always drives carefully but that Chin came out of nowhere. She suggests that it would be better to leave Chin to someone else. As a result, people who were previously angry with the driver of the luxury car now start to doubt Chen's motives and accuse him of trying to cheat. They suggest contacting the police to let them handle the situation. Chin shouts in response to the red-haired girl's accusation and says that what she just said was not true. However, the red-haired girl tells Mu Shushue to return to her car. Despite this, Mu Shushue orders her guards to deal with Chin. However, when Chin sees them leaving, he seizes the opportunity and catches Mu Shushue's legs, telling her that she bumped into him and needs to take responsibility. The red-haired girl intervenes and tells Chin to release Mu Shushue's legs. She accuses Chin of being shameless and taking advantage of Mu Shushue. Chin tells the red-haired girl to leave. Mu Shushua then tries to calm Chen down and offers to take him to the hospital. However, Chen refuses, fearing that Mu Shushua might leave him there and run away, and demands that she takes responsibility for him. The red-haired girl gets angry at Chen and accuses him of being shameless. However, Mu Shushua intervenes and suggests taking Chen to her personal doctor to get him checked. Chen expresses his desire to travel in the luxury car, and while the red-haired girl disagrees, Mu Shushua agrees to let him ride in the car. Chen is happy and thinks about how beautiful and kind Mu Shushue is. They reach Mu Shushue's home, and Mu Shushue instructs her bodyguard to take Chen to the living room and have Dr. Huang examine him while she goes to report to her father. Chen gets upset at seeing Mu Shushue leaving, but the red-haired girl offers to treat his wounds. Later, Mu Shushue meets with her father and explains the situation, mentioning that their products need high-quality raw materials to compete in South Africa. Mu Shushue's father replies to her about the situation and says that the jade raw materials they need are in the hands of the Lin family in the provincial capital. He explains that they have always faced obstacles from them, but recently their aggression has increased. He also mentions that if they cannot deliver the goods on time, the loss will not only affect their assets, but also the business reputation that they have built over the past decades. Mu Shushue proposes to her father that she will marry the heir of the Lin family for the sake of business, but her father refused the proposal. Her father expressed his reluctance to marry his daughter to the Lin family's heir and blamed Mu Shushue's brother for making the situation difficult. Mu Shushue apologized to her father because she couldn't help being a woman. Her father seemed pleased with her, saying that he was glad she was helping him. However, in the midst of their conversation, Chen arrived and informed Mu Shushue that someone was trying to kill him. After Chen informed Mu Shushue that someone was trying to kill him, he hugged her and called her, Honey, which shocked Mu Shushue's father. Mu Shushua's father questioned why Chen was calling his daughter, Honey, Mu Shushua told Chen to let her go, indicating that she was uncomfortable with the situation. At that moment, a red-haired girl and a doctor who had been treating Chen arrived on the scene. They told Chen to stop and were holding knives in their hands. Mu Shushua's father questioned the red-haired girl and the doctor about why they were carrying knives. In response, Chen accused them of trying to harm him by castrating him even though he was not married yet. This statement made the red-haired girl angry and she expressed her frustration with the mess they had gone through to chase Jin. However, instead of taking her seriously, Jin made fun of her. 
Mu Shushue's father ordered the doctor and the red-haired girl to leave the room and asked Jin about his identity. In response, Jin claimed to be Mu Shushue's future husband, which made Mu Shushue's father burst out laughing. However, their conversation was interrupted by a butler who arrived and informed them that Chen was a fool. The butler conducted an investigation and found out that Chen's real name was Jiang Chen, and he came from a village outside the city called Hongxi. According to the butler, Chen was known as a fool in ten miles and eight villages, and he had married the lady of the Gu family six months ago. A few days ago, Chen was expelled from the Gu family for molesting the nanny and stealing property. Mu Shushua's father became furious after learning about Chen's true identity and ordered the Mu family's experts to kill him and throw him out of the house. The bodyguards tried to execute the order, but Chen surprised them by kicking one of the bodyguards, who flew back and hit the wall, getting knocked out. Chen's unexpected attack surprised Mu Shushue, who questioned whether he was really a fool. Despite their colleague being beaten up, the other bodyguards threatened to kill Chen, but Mu Shushue's father intervened and ordered them to stand down. Mu Shushue's father is amazed by Chen's fighting ability and wonders how he could hurt their hidden martial artists with just one move. Meanwhile, Chen boasts about his abilities and claims that he can do great things like destroy the Lin family, make Xingxian the world's largest conglomerate, and make Mu Shushue's father the richest man in the world. Chen then informs Mu Shushue's father that the Lin family's representatives are on their way to propose, and they will arrive the following morning. Mu Shushue is seeking advice on what to do, and Chen suggests that they should look for a son-in-law. Mu Shushue agrees, but her father seems hesitant. However, he quickly orders his butler to gather information on young talents who might be suitable candidates for his daughter. Chen then points out that he himself would make a great son-in-law, but Mu Shushue's father refuses. Chen explains that wealthy and powerful families usually do not allow their children to marry less influential families, and even if they did, there is a risk that they would take advantage of the family's property. Mu Shushue questions Chen about what he can bring to the Mu family if he were to become her husband. In response, Chin directs her attention to his injuries and proceeds to heal them instantly. This surprises Mu Shushue, who realizes that Jiang Chen is not an ordinary person. She also recalls how he was able to easily defeat a skilled martial artist from the Mu family earlier. This leads her to believe that Chen might be a hidden master. Impressed by his abilities, Mu Shushue decides to make Chen her husband and informs her father of her decision. Next, a man with red hair is bothering Chen's sister at their home. He is threatening to take her with him if Chen's brother does not pay him within three days. However, Chen's sister assures him that her brother will take care of the matter. As they wait, a group of luxury cars arrives at Chen's house, impressing the man with red hair. Chen then gets out of one of the cars and comments on the situation, asking where the group of people blocking his door came from and referring to them as wild dogs. Chen's sister becomes emotional upon seeing him, but Chen assures her that everything will be all right now that he is here. Ji Erdin then shows Chen a paper stating that his family owes him a debt. This angers Chen, and he burns the paper along with Ji Erdin's hand. This act scares the people who are with Ji Erdin. As Chen begins to repay the debt, he tells Ji Erdin that his family only borrowed 3,000 from him, so he will only return that amount. However, he goes on to say that Ji Erdin had repeatedly beaten and frightened his family, causing them medical expenses and mental damage. Therefore, the rest of the money is considered Ji Erdin's compensation for those damages. After Chin explains the situation to Ji Erdin and demands compensation for the damages caused to his family, Ji Erdin agrees to his terms. Chin then orders Ji Erdin to live with the pigs in the pigsty for a week to solve the problem between them, and Ji Erdin agrees to the challenge. Meanwhile, at the Gu family villa, the head of the Gu family, Gu Lin Tang, Xiao Bai, and Guan Ai are sitting and discussing Chin. Guan Qi asks how the head of the Mu family, Mu Tiandang, agreed to marry his daughter to Chin. Xiao Bai responds to Guan Qi's question about how Mu Tianang agreed to let his daughter marry Chen. Xiao Bai explains that the invitations for the marriage were sent directly to Xia's house, so there was no need to worry about it. However, Xiao Bai is furious because he is the heir of the Dingfeng group, but he has not been able to meet Mu Shushue. He wonders how Chen was able to meet her. In response, Guan Qi explains that Jiang Chen's name was not on the invitation list, and their people only saw him entering Mu's house. Guanxi suggests that the Mu family may be more concerned about the Lin family in the provincial capital, and that is why they allowed Chen to meet Mu Shushue. Gu Lin Tang agrees with two people on an unknown topic, but Xiao Bai becomes angry and threatens to go to a wedding to see who the groom is. Guanxi tries to intervene, but her father stops her. Gu Lin Tang explains that Xiao Bai's uncle is the mayor of Qianchuan City and that their current financial stability is thanks to the Dingfeng Group's crisis. 
The scene shifts to the wedding site of the Mu family, where Chin is busy treating a lady. The lady expresses concern about her weight and asks if Chin will still be able to take care of her in the future. Chen responds by saying that he only helped her lose weight because she helped him apply makeup, and he charges a lot of money for his services. The lady becomes disappointed when Chen asks for money for his services. Meanwhile, at the wedding place, a man with blonde hair makes a fuss, saying that Mu Shushua will be his and he will kill the groom. The bodyguards take the man out of the party. It is then announced to welcome the bride and groom, and Chen, who is in a lady's wedding dress, and Mu Shushua, who is in a groom's dress, enter. But everyone starts to gossip about Chen's appearance, thinking that the groom is a pervert. Mu Shushua's father gets angry about Chen's appearance, but he was stopped by a lady by his side. Suddenly, the wedding gate opens, and a man with his bald bodyguard enters and says, Mr. Mu, I'm afraid it is not appropriate to not invite me to your daughter's wedding. Chen asks Mu Shushua about the person who just entered the wedding, and Mu Shushua explains that it is the Lin family, led by Lin Ziyuan, who is nicknamed Smiling Tiger. He is the younger brother of the head of the Lin family and the current number two Lin family member. The bald man with him is his most reliable accomplice. Chen then reflects on the bald man's level of power, which he believes to be at least at the dark power level. He goes on to explain that, when he asked Mu family martial artists about martial artists, they explained that there are five levels of martial artists, Jing Jin, Ming Jin, and Jin, Hua Jin, and Dan Jin. Each stage is subdivided into early, middle, and late stages. It is said that Dan Jin's last stage martial artists can cultivate a body-protecting aura, and there are only ten martial artists in all of Huaxia who can reach the Dan Jin level. Chin is impressed by the power of the Lin family, and he suspects that there is an expert behind their strength. Meanwhile, Mu Shushua's father confronts Lin Ziyuan and asks why he is there. Lin Ziyuan apologizes for coming uninvited, and Mu Shushua's father orders the wedding to proceed. However, as the host begins to announce the wedding, a dagger suddenly flies toward Chen and shatters his mask into pieces. The bald man who threw the dagger mocks Chen, questioning why he wears a mask at his own wedding and suggesting that he is unable to meet other people. Chen responds to the bald man's taunt by saying that he can remove his mask if the man wants to see his face. However, Lin Ziyuan intervenes and slaps the bald man, reprimanding him for throwing a dangerous weapon and potentially harming someone. Chen is surprised to see that a warrior with dark energy could not avoid a slap from a commoner. The bald man, named Watucho, stubbornly refuses to apologize to Mu Shushua's father and declares that he will only kneel to his master for the rest of his life. Lin Ziyuan apologizes to Mu Shushua's father for the interruption caused by his people and asks for forgiveness. Mu Shushua's father accepts the apology, and Mu Shushua asks if Chin is okay after the dagger incident. Chin assures him that he is fine and explains that he intentionally did not dodge the dagger to see what kind of trick they were pulling. He further declares that he will make the Lin family kneel in front of his father-in-law and the Mu family and repent. After Chin reveals his face, people start insulting him and accusing him of being a fool. They also blame Mu Shushua for marrying someone who is already married. Xiao Bai, who is among the crowd, expresses his intention to expose Chen's shame and make him feel ashamed, as well as humiliate the Mu family. Meanwhile, Lin Ziyuan questions Mu Shushua's father about why he would marry off his daughter to a fool suggesting that it would ruin her life and result in their children being idiots. Mu Shushue is about to get into a heated argument with Lin Ziyuan after he insulted her husband Chen and their marriage. However, Chen steps in and tells Mu Shushue to let him handle the situation. He then takes a mic from the host's hand and declares that he is indeed a fool, but even a fool can marry Mu Shushue, who he describes as a great goddess. He further taunts Lin Ziyuan saying that he can't even touch Mu Shushue's toes and that he doesn't care if others are envious of their marriage. A man among the crowd insults Jiang Qin, calling him a fool and saying that the Mu family will soon throw him out. Jiang Qin gets angry and his eyes turn purple, causing the man to be forced to the ground. Jiang Qin tells the man to leave the marriage hall. Xiao Bai attempted to execute a plan that ultimately failed due to Chen's actions. Xiao Bai becomes angry and declares that he will make Chen cry, and then instructs her team to implement Plan B. Chen, however, is not intimidated and responds with a smirk, calling Xia Bai and her team losers and challenging them to try any other tricks they may have. Unexpectedly, a woman with brown hair arrives and refers to Chen as hubby, causing him to become confused and ask who she is. The woman responds by reminding Chen of their promise to each other, in which he said he didn't mind her status as a street girl. She then reveals that she is carrying Chen's child and questions how he could marry someone else in light of this information. Chen thinks that the people who come up with the trick are too cruel. 
Meanwhile, people around them are gossiping about the situation. Some express surprise and make comments about Chen and Miss Mu's taste, while others remark on Mu Tiandong's broad-mindedness for accepting Chen as his son-in-law. Lin Ziyuan comments on Mu Tiandong's acceptance of Chen, but Tiandong becomes angry and curses Chen. Mu Shixi's mother starts crying and expresses sympathy for her daughter. Chen then asks Shushue if she has any questions, and she responds that she is waiting for an explanation from him. Chen smiles at Shushue and compliments her, saying that she is different from others and deserves to be his wife. He then asks the brown-haired lady to wait before crying and asks if he really promised to be with her. She confirms that he did. However, Chen's eyes suddenly change color to purple, and he asks the brown-haired lady to take a closer look. She seems to be hypnotized and responds that it's not Chen who promised to be with her, but rather someone else. She then points to Xia Bai and claims that he is actually her husband, not Chen. Xia Bai is shocked and confused by the brown-haired lady's claim that she is his wife and he tries to silence her by covering her mouth with his hand. The lady, however, insists that she is his wife and that he had asked her to impersonate Jiang Chen's wife. Xiao Bai denies knowing the woman and tries to silence her again, but she threatens to reveal everything she knows about him if he denies her. Chen then adds a sarcastic comment, mocking Xiao Bai's taste in women. The gossiping among the crowd resumes, with some people commenting on Xiao Bai's supposed wife and his beautiful fiancé, who is revealed to be Miss Gu Anqi of the Gu family and who is also Jiang Chen's ex-wife. Upon hearing this, Tiandang becomes angry and accuses the gossipers of trying to slander his son-in-law, Jiang Chen. He orders Xia Bai and the brown-haired lady to be thrown out, while Chen mocks them. Chen then turns to the rest of the people present, and asks if anyone else has a problem with him joining the Mu family. The people reply in the negative, suggesting that Chen is generally well-regarded and accepted by the Mu family and its associates. Chen looks at Lin Ziyuan and asks if Lin's family will be okay with it, and if they won't hold Chen responsible for the potential breakup. Lin Ziyuan responds by congratulating them and saying that nobody can blame them. Chen then mocks Lin Ziyuan and pushes for the wedding to continue, which angers Lin Ziyuan. Lin Ziyuan asks Baldi if he found any problems before, and Baldi replies that although the two people became strange, there was no sign of being controlled. Lin Ziyuan suspects that something is not right but cannot find any loopholes or evidence to turn the tables on the Mu family yet. He also thinks that Jiang Chen is problematic and should be observed for a while. Next, Chen sitting in the bridal room and thinking about his new wife's thoughts and experiences as a woman. He starts thinking about strange things, and then Shi Xue enters the room and interrupts his thoughts. Shi Xue tells she has something to tell him. Chin makes a humorous comment to Shushua about the hassle of taking off all her clothes before sleeping because she has so many to wear. Shushua hesitates for a bit and reveals to Chin that she doesn't like him and that the marriage is only an act. She tells him that she hopes he won't take it seriously either, but she won't hold him back. Then, Shushua calls someone into the room, which confuses Chin. Chin sees a red-haired girl standing in front of him in his bridal room with his wife and asks her what she is doing there. Chin was shocked to see another girl with Shushue in the bridal room and asks her what it means. Shushue explains that Xiaoyan will take his bridal chamber instead of her, and she won't bother him anymore. Chun is confused by Shushue's intentions and looks at Xiaoyan and says that if that's the case, he won't hesitate. Shushue stands in front of the bridal room door and listens to what is going on inside the room. She hears some misunderstood sentences and feels a little uncomfortable. Meanwhile, inside the room, Chin is treating Xiaoyan, who says that it is very comfortable. Chin explains that he is sorting out the hidden dangers of old diseases in her body and that she will look radiant after he is done. This is how Chin spends his first night with Xiaoyan. In the morning, Chin comes out of the bridal room and comments on how well he slept. He then sees Shi Xue and she makes a sarcastic comment about him being a person addicted to beauty, referring to Xiaoyan. Chin doesn't understand Shi Xue's words and explains that he was tired and inexperienced, which made him take longer. Shi Xue gets angry and tells him to shut up, and urges him to have breakfast as the whole family is waiting. Chen then expresses his confusion about women's behavior, saying they are hard to understand. Next, Chen is getting into a car with some people and instructs the driver to take them to the Palace of Hell. The driver warns Chen that if he goes there, he will immediately lose everything he has. Chen dismisses the warning and promises the driver that he will take him to a good show. The driver explains that the Hell Palace is a well-known entertainment venue among the upper class in Asakawa. It offers a wide range of experiences, including food, culture, alternative art, screenings of banned films, and gambling. Chun and his companions enter the Hell Palace, a well-known place for the upper class in Asakawa, where they engage in gambling. Chun sits on a chair and asks the lady in front of him, 
who is referred to as the banker if he can borrow two gold bricks. The banker agrees and orders a waiter to bring the bricks. Chin uses the gold bricks to gamble and loses all of it when he bets small. The banker lady says young Master Jiang appears to have lost a large sum of money in a gambling game, and Chin says it's his first time and asks to borrow two gold bricks to continue playing. The banker lady remarks that the gold bricks are worth over 1 million yuan each and that Jiang lost over 2 million yuan in just 5 minutes. She expresses disappointment in his loss. Jin continues to gamble even after losing all his previous games. One of his associates advises him to stop, but Jin insists on continuing because he thinks he is about to win. However, he ends up losing again and is left with only two gold bricks. Meanwhile, Xiao Bai, who is observing this situation, makes a comment about Chen's reckless behavior, saying that he's dug himself into a hole and now must face the consequences. Xia Bai also expresses a desire to trap Chen and make him lose even more. Bu Qian makes a comment about Chen, saying that he is a loser who will go bankrupt because he doesn't know how to gamble properly. Gu Qian also implies that Chen deserves to lose because he made a mistake by getting involved in gambling. Xia Bai also speaks about Chen, expressing a desire for revenge because Chen had made him look bad in the past. Xia Bai wants Chen to experience despair and failure. However, the banker lady tries to consult Chen by suggesting that he play again and possibly win back his losses. Despite having lost all his money, Chen seems undeterred and even optimistic about his chances. He smiles and asks to borrow ten gold bricks. A half-bald man reacts to Chen's request to borrow ten gold bricks by stating that they are worth more than ten million yuan. Another man, who is wearing a blue dress, mocks Chen, saying that he is a rookie who will lose all his money quickly. Despite the criticism, Chin continues to gamble and places another bet on small. The banker lady confirms his bet, and Xiao Bai, who has been observing the situation, comments on the croupier's skill and reputation as the king of thousands of kings. Xiao Bai suggests that Chin is unlikely to win by luck and predicts that he will become a lost dog. The banker lady shuffles the dice and comments on Chen's youth, expressing sympathy for his losses. However, when she reveals the dice, she is confused because they all show small numbers. Chin sees this and claims that he has won the round. Xia Bai also expresses confusion about the situation and questions the croupier's actions, while Gu Qian suggests that they should take advantage of Chen's addiction to gambling and win again. The banker lady asks Chen if he is still playing, and he confirms that he is by betting all 20 of his gold bricks. The lady is determined not to make any mistakes this time and shuffles the dice before revealing them. However, Chen wins again. Chen comments on his luck and continues to bet, always choosing small and winning every time. The other people betting alongside Chen also win. Chen then jokes about whether the Hell Palace has enough cash reserves to exchange their gold bricks for money. However, when they try to exchange their gold bricks for cash, the manager informs them that it is not possible at the moment, apologizing for the inconvenience. The people who wanted to exchange their gold bricks for cash become angry and start insulting the Hell Palace and its owner because they were not able to exchange their gold bricks for cash. The manager tries to calm them down by explaining that it's not that they can't afford to pay, but the bank cannot transfer more cash at the moment, and they have no control over that. Upon hearing this, Chen tells his people to go to the next place to bet. The people who went along with Chen are excited and urge others to keep up with him, as they believe he can bring them more money. After Chen left the Hell Palace, Xia Bai became angry and accused him of forcing him to close down the palace that he had worked hard to build. Xia Bai expressed his desire for Chen's death but Gu Qian tried to calm him down. However, Xia Bai instead lashed out at Gu Qian and reminded him that the Gu family only contributed 10% of the capital, implying that he had no right to worry about the situation. Gu Qian, who was engaged to Xia Bai, responded by saying that she was worried about his difficulties, despite not having contributed as much capital as Xia Bai. She then revealed that she had arranged for someone to deal with Chen's intrusion and proceeded to explain his plan to Xia Bai. Xia Bai smiled and expressed his approval of Gu Qian's plan to ruin Jiang Chen and his Mu family. He also praised Gu Qian, calling her his sweetheart. Xia Bai then apologized for his earlier outburst, asking if Gu Qian was hurt. Gu Qian replied that she was in pain and jokingly asked Xia Bai to take responsibility for it. Next, the scene takes place in front of a building where Chen and other people are standing. It appears to be another gambling establishment where Chen had previously gambled and won everything. A man with blue hair asks Chen if they should continue closing down small clubs, to which Chen agrees and declares that he will close all of Sha's stores that night, causing Sha to lose everything and go bankrupt. While Chen is planning his next move, he notices a picture of himself on an information board nearby. Curious, he approaches the board to read what is written along with his picture. 
The text alleges that Jiang Qin, the richest man in the city, is a notorious gambler suspected of gambling with $10 million in gold. Qin is shocked to see the information board's allegations against him and realizes that Xiao Bai had used this as a tactic to manipulate public opinion against him. He swears to teach Xiao Bai a lesson and orders his men to go to the orphanage. After a while, Xiao Bai and Gu Qian see another bulletin praising Qin for donating millions, and Xiao Bai becomes furious with Gu Qian for suggesting a plan that failed to ruin Qin. Xiao Bai is further frustrated when a man enters the room and reports that they had lost nearly 100 million in a financial settlement the night before. Despite the setback, Xiao Bai orders the man to keep the business open, determined to earn the money back sooner or later. He also expresses his disbelief that Jiang Qin can keep coming back every night to close down their establishments. The next morning, people start gossiping about Jiang Qin, the son-in-law of the Mu family, and his recent success in closing down several clubs owned by Ding Feng's young master, Xia Bai, within a few days. They also discuss how Ding Feng's finances were already in a tight spot, and now they are even worse off due to Chen's actions. Some people also share rumors that they have heard, saying that Jiang Qin had vowed to make Xiao Bai kneel down and apologize. They also mention that Qin has threatened to patronize any new establishment that Xiao Bai opens. Next, Qin is sitting while Xiao Bai is kneeling down in front of him, begging for forgiveness. Xiao Bai pleads with Qin to raise his hand and forgive him. Qin responds by telling Xiao Bai to leave and warning him not to appear in front of him again. Qin threatens that if Xiao Bai dares to appear again, he will make him go bankrupt. Xiao Bai agrees to Chen's conditions. After Chen and his people leave, Xiao Bai becomes furious and vows to make Chen kneel down and beg him someday. This shows that Xiao Bai is still not giving up on his revenge against Chen and is determined to find a way to defeat him. Next, Shishue, her father Mu Tiandang, her mother, and Chen are all present in Mu's villa. Mu Tiandang is interrogating Chen and asking him what he has been doing for the past two days. Chen replies that he has been playing with friends but that he will help find a solution to the crisis. However, Mu Tianang gets angry and accuses Chen of lying and lacking integrity. He questions where the solution is and implies that Chen is just wasting his time playing poker. Chen responds to Mu Tianang's accusation of lying by showing him a bottle of pink liquid and claiming that it is the key for the Mu family to survive the crisis. Shi Xu asks what it is, and Chen explains that it is a product that will take Xin Xian to a higher level in a short amount of time. He mentions that the Lin family had cut off their jade supply, which would result in significant financial and reputational losses. However, the pink liquid, if mass-produced, could compensate for the loss. In this scene, Mu Tianding seems happy with Chen's explanation and praises him for his work on the scar cream, indicating that it has excellent sales. Chen responds to Mu Tianding's praise by saying that he has many good prescriptions and that Tianding can wait and count the money in the future. Tianding expresses his trust in Chen. However, the scene is interrupted by a butler rushing in and announcing that Shishue has been kidnapped. Tianding becomes frightened and assumes that someone is jealous of their sales and wants to harm them. He asks Chen what they should do. Chen becomes angry upon hearing that Shishue has been kidnapped and vows to find out who is responsible. Meanwhile, Shishue is shown tied up near a river and shouting at her captors to leave her alone and not touch her. Her kidnappers are shown smiling oddly. One of the kidnappers asks another if they should dispose of Shishua since Chen has not shown up yet, despite the time being half past three. Shishua becomes frightened and pleads with the kidnappers not to approach her. She then shouts for Chen to come and rescue her. Shishua yells for help and warns the kidnappers not to touch him. The kidnappers respond, telling him to keep shouting loudly. Suddenly, Shishua sees Chen and calls out his name. Chen appears angry and sad and apologizes for not protecting Shishua well enough. His body emits blue light. One of the kidnappers recognizes Chen as Jiang Chen and asks him to hand over the recipe for a scar removing ointment. The other kidnapper adds that if Chen gives them the recipe, they will give him a quick death. While the kidnappers are threatening Chen, he swiftly grabs one of their faces and throws them to the ground. Chen's eyes turn purple with anger as he demands that the kidnapper repeat the word they were saying. Upon seeing Chen's powers, the kidnappers become scared, but one of them still urges the others to attack and kill him insisting that they can win with their numbers. However, Chin defeats them all and approaches Shishue, apologizing for being late and promising that it won't happen again. Shishue reassures him, saying that it's all right and that she doesn't blame him. Chin then approaches one of the kidnappers and demands to know who they are working for. However, he notices that the kidnapper is holding a remote for a bomb. Realizing the danger, Chin grabs Shishue and starts running. He expresses his disbelief at the situation and then suddenly laughs saying that the kidnappers committed so many sins that they exploded on the spot. 
Chin expresses his concern about how to find the mastermind behind the incident, realizing that they had placed the restriction on the martial artists within the group of thugs. He laughs confidently and boldly declares that the mastermind should tremble in fear because he is coming for them. A few days later, Chin is watching television when the news anchor reports on the incident. The anchor stands in front of the headquarters of the underground organization known as the White Tiger Hall and reveals that they were attacked by an unidentified individual a few days ago, resulting in the death of all 132 members. Upon hearing the news, Chen reflects on the fact that although he eliminated the White Tiger Hall, he still couldn't capture the mastermind behind it. He recognizes the situation as a potential threat. Then, Chen notices Shi Xue approaching and reprimands her, reminding her that he had instructed her to inform him if she was going out. He declares that he will follow her to ensure her safety. Shershua responds, asserting that she is not as vulnerable as Chen may perceive her to be. She then sits beside Chen and informs him that she has something else to discuss. The Lin family has organized a stone gambling festival and has invited both of them. Shershua asks Chen if he would like to attend. Upon hearing Shershua's invitation, Chen becomes happy and embraces her, expressing his joy. He tells her that she has started seeking his opinion on family matters and he feels touched and grateful. Shershua's cheeks blush, and she playfully denies Chen's reaction, saying that he is overreacting. Chen responds to Shershua, expressing that she wouldn't fully understand his feelings because he has never been treated like a human being since he was young. He tells her that she is the best, and he feels incredibly happy with her. In response, Shershua says that she will inform Chen if there is anything important in the future, indicating her willingness to share things with him. Suddenly, a red-haired girl arrives and accuses Chen of harassing the mistress, Shushua. She challenges him to confront her instead. Chen retorts by saying that he doesn't want a tigress like her. The red-haired girl objects to being called a tigress and demands that Chen stop right there. After the red-haired girl leaves the room, Shushua responds, saying that actually, she doesn't mind the situation or their interaction. Next, in a building in the city, a conversation takes place between a brown-haired man and a gray-haired man. The brown-haired man addresses the gray-haired man as Jia Hao, asking if he has come up with a plan to bring down the Mu family. Jia Hao confidently responds, stating that not only will he make the Mu family suffer greatly, but he also intends to eliminate Mu Shishue and her unintelligent husband. In his thoughts, Jia Hao expresses his anger, thinking about how dare someone harms his woman. He vows to torture them until they wish for their own demise. Next, Chen and Shishue are traveling to the event by train. Chin draws Shushua's attention to the view outside and remarks on how fast the train is moving, causing only silhouettes to be visible. He predicts that they will reach Jin Lin in no time due to the train's speed. A man sitting in front of Chin overhears his comment and laughs, considering Chin to be ignorant. Chin looks at the man but responds with laughter of his own, making a playful remark. He jokes, saying that he thought the train only allowed humans on board, and questions why there is a pig present, referring to the man in a humorous way. The man becomes angry at Chen's comment and forcefully grabs Chen's collar, cursing at him. He questions who Chen is calling a pig. Chen maintains his smile and confidently reaffirms that he is indeed referring to the man. The man threatens Chen, asking if he wants to get beaten up. An old lady intervenes and politely interrupts the situation, informing them that the seat they are occupying is actually her seat. The man, confused, asks the old lady what she said. The old lady calmly shows her ticket and reiterates that the seat belongs to her. She suggests that the man may have taken the wrong seat and asks him to move. Chen returns to Shushue and predicts that the man will not give up his seat to the old lady. He proposes a playful bet, saying that if he is correct, Shushue should kiss him. Shushue replies with a dismissive tone, stating that if Chen wants to play games, he should do so on his own. The man who was arguing with Chen and the old lady suddenly begins to fake a heart condition, apologizing to the old lady and claiming he cannot move from his seat due to his ailment. Upon hearing the man's excuse, Chen turns to Shushua and reminds her that he was right about the man not giving up his seat. He playfully insists that Shushua must keep her promise. Shushua becomes shy and tells Chen to stop and be quiet, reminding him that they will be arriving soon and they shouldn't fool around. Suddenly, a boy wearing a cap appears and directs his comment toward Chen, questioning what is happening today and why there are so many unpleasant individuals on the train. He describes one as a selfish man and the other as a perverted man likely referring to the earlier incidents. The boy looks at Shushue and assures her that she shouldn't worry because justice exists in this world. He declares himself a teenager with a cause and promises to never let a lady be in danger. He offers to help Shushue by calling the police. The boy then attempts to flirt with Shushue, 
bragging that he is from the boxing club at his school and claiming that he can fight ten people like the man from earlier all at once. Continuing his attempts at impressing Shushua, the boy asks where she is heading. He suggests that he can be her bodyguard and escort her to a safe place. Shushua responds, rejecting the boy's advances and clarifying that he has misunderstood the situation. The man who had earlier provoked him directs his words toward the boy, accusing him of pretending to be righteous in order to flirt with the girl. He questions the boy's right to pass judgment on him, and deems his behavior disgusting and shameless. Enraged by the man's accusations, the boy firmly grabs the man's collar and retorts, challenging his assumption that everyone is perverted like him. He asserts that he used to rank third in the academic standings at Jinling University, and warns the man against using his corrupted mindset to judge him. The man counters by belittling the boy, claiming that his righteousness is merely sweet talk and dismissing him as a poor student. He further adds that he doubts the boy will be able to find a job after graduating. The boy retaliates against the man's insults, threatening him by calling him a fat pig and vowing to beat him up. The commotion attracts the attention of other passengers on the train, and they start gossiping about the fight. One person warns others to stay away and not get splashed by any blood. Shushua turns to Chin and inquires if he had any involvement in the fight, questioning if it was his doing. Chin assures Shushua that he is innocent and explains that he cannot control the emotions and actions of other people. Continuing his explanation, Chin expresses his belief that when the dark side of a person is exposed and they feel humiliated, they tend to become furious. He suggests that this is the true nature of humans. Next, in the leisure resort Garden of Eden, Chin was enjoying the view of the ladies enjoying themselves in the swimming pool. Chin made a comment about the abundance of attractive women on the Xinxian Corporation's property and expressed disappointment that his wife was not present to wear a swimsuit as well. However, Chen's observation was interrupted by a group of men who were scaring people away, claiming that their boss had reserved the entire area. Chin was appalled by the behavior of these men and wondered why the management of the resort was allowing them to tarnish its reputation. He resolved to inform his wife about the incident and urge her to strengthen the resort's management. Suddenly, Chin noticed a man whom he recognized as the uncle from the train and expressed his misfortune. Meanwhile, the man was instructing his people to clear the place out and was frustrated that Chin was still present. A boy wearing the black cap reassured Mr. Zhu, saying that the person they were dealing with was someone who didn't know their place, and he would chase them away. He then approached Chin and aggressively questioned why he was staring and threatened to harm his eyes. Chin, however, maintained a smile and sarcastically commented on the boy's association with the overweight individual. The boy in the cap recognized Chin as the person from the train and expressed his intention to settle their previous dispute. He blamed Chin for their altercation on the train and emphasized that Chin had not only offended him but also offended Mr. Zhu, whose identity he deemed significant. The boy warned Chin that he was looking for trouble and seemingly seeking his own demise. Chin responded apologetically, stating that there had been an influx of unruly individuals lately, and questioned what kind of animals the two men were. The man Chin recognized from the train became infuriated and instructed the boy in the cap to physically attack Chin. The cap boy, fueled by anger, attempted to punch Chin while verbally expressing his outrage at being referred to as an animal. However, unexpectedly, his fist inadvertently struck the man from the train instead of Chin. Confused by what just happened, the cap boy couldn't comprehend the situation. Enraged by being hit, the man threatened the cap boy, questioning his desire to continue living and ordered his bodyguards to beat the cat boy mercilessly until his demise. The cat boy desperately pleaded with Mr. Zhu, insisting that it was a misunderstanding and he hadn't intended to hit him. However, despite his protests, the man's bodyguard began to beat the cat boy while he continued to deny his involvement. Looking at Chin, the cat boy suddenly accused him, claiming that Chin must have somehow controlled his body, leading to the unintended assault on Mr. Zhu. However, the man remained unconvinced and dismissed the cat boy's explanation stating that he believed the cap boy had deliberately hit him. In response, the man ordered his bodyguards to also beat Chin. The man then issued a menacing threat to both the cap boy and Chin, declaring that neither of them would be allowed to leave the premises. Chin, undeterred, defiantly remarked that the man was rushing to meet his own demise in hell. A man wearing a yellow t-shirt, surrounded by several girls, arrived on the scene and inquired about the person who had offended Mr. Zhu. Observing the man in the yellow t-shirt, Chin expressed his amazement noting how convincingly he portrayed the role of a gangster. The man in the yellow t-shirt turned to Xu and questioned what was happening in Jinling, asking if someone had dared to offend the boss of the area. Xu identified the culprit as a person he referred to with a derogatory term and urgently requested the assistance of Anu, someone who seemed to be an assassin, in teaching that person a lesson. Following Xu's command, 
The man who appeared to be an assassin stepped forward to attack Chen, while Zhu and the man in the yellow t-shirt continued their conversation, discussing the need for someone like Anu, an expert, to be provided to Zhu. Zhu reminded the man in the yellow t-shirt, addressed as young Master Liang, of his promise to find an expert similar to Anu and inquired about the time frame for doing so. The man in the yellow t-shirt responded to Zhu's determination by cautioning him not to rush, explaining that Anu's martial brother would soon emerge from seclusion, and he was even stronger than Anu. However, he mentioned that securing the services of Anu's martial brother might be challenging due to the high demand for his skills, as over a hundred people were reportedly interested in hiring him. Undeterred, Zhu motivated himself, asserting that he would spare no expense to secure the expert's assistance. Suddenly, the man who had been ordered to kill Chen returned unexpectedly, flying through the air and colliding with Zhu. Both individuals were sent flying and rendered unconscious by the impact. Witnessing this turn of events, the man in the yellow t-shirt marveled at the situation, realizing that Anu, who was an expert at the half-step Mingjin level, had lost instantaneously. He pondered the extraordinary strength of the person responsible for defeating Anu, expressing astonishment at encountering such a powerful individual in Jin Ling. Chen, observing the chaos, fearlessly challenged them, inviting anyone else who dared to confront him to do so simultaneously. At that moment, the manager of the establishment arrived and inquired about the commotion, seeking to understand what had transpired. The cat boy appeared pleased by the manager's presence and immediately pointed toward Chen, accusing him of employing demonic arts. The cat boy claimed that not only had Chen manipulated him into attacking Mr. Zhu, but he had also defeated a subordinate of young Master Liang. However, the manager abruptly kicked the cat boy, prompting the cat boy to question why he had been struck. In response, the manager sternly warned the cat boy to remain silent if he wished to avoid suffering a fate similar to his boss. Turning his attention to Chen, the manager approached him and offered an apology, addressing Chen as young master. Zhu, taken aback by this revelation, was shocked to learn that Chen held such a significant position as the young master of the Xinxian Corporation. The manager took charge and issued a stern warning to Zhu's bodyguards. He commanded them to swiftly escort their boss out of the Garden of Eden and instructed them to inform Zhu that he had three days to leave Jinling, or else they would face severe consequences for daring to offend his young master. Following the manager's threats, Zhu reluctantly left the premises along with his bodyguards. Meanwhile, Chin expressed his frustration finding the situation tiresome and referring to it as a pile of trash that had dampened his mood. He inquired about the status of his wife's meeting, and the manager assured him that it had just concluded, offering to accompany Chin to the location. Observing these events unfold, the man in the yellow t-shirt contemplated the strength displayed by the young master of the Xinxian Corporation. He recognized that this encounter would likely bring about significant changes in Jin Ling, foreshadowing a transformation in the city's dynamics. Next, Chen and Shushua were reunited and Chen immediately embraced Shushua, expressing how much he missed her. Shushua playfully responded, remarking that they had only been apart for half a day and that Chen was exaggerating his longing. In response, Chen made a funny face, comparing each second without Shushua to a year. Shushua decided to end the teasing and moved on to discuss their plans for the following day. She informed Chen that they would be attending the Stone Gambling Festival and asked if he had a formal outfit for the occasion. Chen, seemingly content with his current attire, questioned the necessity of changing clothes, stating that his current shirt looked lively. However, Shushua insisted that they find a suitable outfit and suggested they visit a shopping center to make the purchase. Chen and Shushua embarked on their journey to buy clothes together. Shushua questioned whether Chen truly didn't want her company, to which Chen reassured her, stating that he knew how to shop for clothes and suggested that they each go their separate ways. Chen pointed out that Shushua also needed to buy clothes and proposed meeting up later. Shushua requested that Chen wait for her in the mall after he finished his own shopping, and Chen agreed to her request. As they entered the mall, a salesgirl greeted Chen and asked him what he needed. Chen responded by saying that he was just browsing and didn't require any specific assistance at the moment. The salesgirl's demeanor took a negative turn following Chen's response. She abruptly informed him that they did not welcome customers who were only browsing and suggested that he leave if he had no intention of making a purchase. Perplexed by her remark, Chen inquired about her meaning. Just then, a couple approached the scene and began expressing their dissatisfaction with the product's quality at the store. Observing this, Chen questioned the salesgirl, pointing out that the couple hadn't bought anything either, and yet she hadn't asked them to leave. In a rather disrespectful manner, the salesgirl retorted by saying, Because you're poor, insinuating that Chen's financial situation was the reason for the differential treatment. The couple, now taking the opportunity to insult Chen, 
engaged in a verbal attack. The girl with pink hair commented on the crowded nature of the shop, attributing it to people like Chin who only engaged in window shopping without making any purchases. She questioned why the salesgirl allowed him to be present in the store. The salesgirl, joining in on the insults, echoed the sentiment and directly addressed Chin as a nuisance, demanding that he leave the premises immediately. Chen, undeterred, warned both the couple that they would face unfortunate circumstances as a result of their behavior. Enraged by Chen's words, the pink-haired girl attempted to slap him, vowing to physically assault him for his curse. However, Chen employed his powers, resulting in the girl's clothes tearing from the back. The tear revealed writing on her back that read, Mr. Wang was here, further adding to the confusion and surprise in the situation. The pink-haired girl's boyfriend, filled with anger and disbelief, confronted her about the apparent tattoo of another man's name on her body. In a fit of rage, he slapped her, expressing his outrage and declaring that their relationship was over. Despite her attempts to explain herself, the man refused to listen and left abruptly, severing their connection. Feeling a mix of emotions, the pink-haired girl directed her attention toward Chen, blaming him for the situation. As tension mounted, the boss of the mall arrived at the scene, demanding to know who was responsible for causing the disturbance. The boss issued a threat, implying that the individual involved must have a death wish to engage in such behavior. The salesgirl, eager to report the incident, immediately points towards Chin, emphasizing his disheveled appearance and accusing him of starting a fight with the pink-haired girl. She further asserts that his language is vulgar. In response, the pink-haired girl, fueled by her excitement upon seeing the boss, urges him to chase Chin out, claiming that he framed her. However, instead of reprimanding Chin, the boss humbly bows his head in front of him expressing his lack of awareness regarding Chen's visit and apologizing for any shortcomings in their hospitality. The unexpected display of deference leaves both the salesgirl and the pink-haired girl puzzled, unaware of the powerful figure Chen truly is, having witnessed his display of power at the hotel. Taking charge, the boss commands his guards to escort both the salesgirl and the pink-haired girl out of the premises. He imposes a ban on the pink-haired girl, forbidding her from entering any of his shops. Additionally, he declares that he will not employ the salesgirl in any of his establishments. Once the two troublemakers have been removed, the boss addresses Chin directly, acknowledging him as young Master Jiang and offering his personal assistance in finding the desired clothing. Chen's memory is jogged, and he recognizes the boss as the person he encountered at the swimming pool the previous day. Expressing his recollection, Chin acknowledges the boss and appreciates his offer, stating that he can choose any clothes he desires from the shop. The boss graciously accepts Chen's gratitude. Later, as Chen exits the mall, he reunites with Shishue, who had been waiting outside. Curious about the number of clothes Chen purchased, Shishue inquires about his shopping spree. Chen playfully responds, explaining that since the clothes were free, he took as many as he wanted. However, when Shishue notices the boss personally bidding farewell to Chen, she understands the underlying significance and realizes that the boss, like many others, is wary of Jiang Chen's influence. Next, as the preparations for the party continue, Chin admires himself in the mirror, noting how perfectly the suit fits him. Shushua joins him in the room, announcing her readiness and suggesting they leave. Shushua admires Chen's appearance in the suit, appreciating how handsome he looks. Meanwhile, Chin shares the same sentiment about Shushua, finding her beautiful in her attire. Chin playfully asks Shushua for permission to be her partner for the event, referring to her as his gorgeous lady. Shushua smiles and agrees, suggesting they proceed to meet the Lin family. Upon arriving at the venue of the Stone Gambling Festival and stepping out of their car, the onlookers mistake Chin and Shushua for celebrities due to their presence and stylish appearance. Chin teasingly remarks to Shushua, pointing out that people are praising him, her husband, and inquires if she feels proud. Shushua playfully responds, suggesting that he would appear even more handsome if he remained silent. However, their playful banter is interrupted when a distinguished, gray-haired man with an extravagant outfit approaches them. He warmly greets Shushua by her name, which immediately catches Chen's attention. Chen becomes serious, questioning the man's audacity and demanding to know who he thinks he is to address his wife so familiarly. The man named Lin Jiahao insults Chen and questions his worthiness to be called Shushua's husband. Shushua gets angry and asks Lin Jiahao to mind his language, asserting that Chen is her husband. She also requests Lin Jiahao to refer to her by her full name, or as Ms. Mu since they are not close. Chin feels touched by Shi Xue's defense, and realizes he has fallen in love with her once again. Lin Jiahao continues his insults, calling Chin incompetent and implying that Shi Xue is a prostitute hired by wealthy women. This angers Shi Xue, but Chin steps forward and sarcastically greets Lin Jiahao, 
expressing interest in being shown around as previously suggested. As Chen shakes hands with Lin Jiahao, he realizes that Chen is not weak and can handle himself. Lin Jiahao becomes frightened and reluctantly assumes responsibility for Chen's hospitality as the host, stating that since Chen is Shi Xue's husband, he should follow him. After Chen and Shi Xue leave, Lin Jiahao threatens them, saying that they won't even know how they will die. Later, Chen informs Shu Xue about people inspecting stones nearby. Chen takes Shu Xue to the stone inspection area and excitedly exclaims that he believes he has found a valuable stone, referring to it as the jackpot. When the stone is eventually cut in half, revealing it to be a jade stone, Chen laughs and proudly declares that his eyes are sharp. Lin Jiahao approaches the couple and asks if they are enjoying themselves. He mentions that there are high-quality stones ahead and offers to take them there as a way to make up for his earlier disrespectful behavior. However, Chen ignores Lin Jiahao's comment and continues walking with Shu Xue. Angered by this, Lin Jiahao insults Chen, calling him a dumbass and mocking his claim of being an expert. Lin Jiahao asserts that it only takes a moment for someone's fortunes to change, to either become poor or rich, and to go to heaven or hell. He threatens to show Chen the meaning of this statement on that day. Lin Jiahao invites Chen to gamble with him, suggesting that it's not fun to play alone. He explains the rules of the game, where each person chooses three stones and publicly cuts them open. The person whose stones are worth more will be declared the winner. Chen expresses interest in the game and asks about the bet involved. Lin Jiahao responds by stating that if Chen loses, he must immediately leave Shi Xue's side. Upon hearing this, Shi Xue becomes angry and reprimands Lin Jiahao, stating that he is crossing a line. Chen responds to Lin Jiahao's proposal by suggesting that if Lin Jiahao loses, he should kneel down and address Chen as his grandfather. Chen then reassures Shi Xue, saying that he won't leave her and that they will have a grandson soon. Shi Xue responds with a warning for Chen to keep his promise. Word of the gambling proposition spreads throughout the event, and people begin to gossip about it. One person mentions that young Master Lin will be gambling against the husband of the Mu family. Another person adds a derogatory comment, saying they heard that Chen is mentally challenged and questions how he can be a match for Master Lin. Another rumor circulates, claiming that Mu Shishua was initially supposed to marry young Master Lin, but suddenly married Chen instead. It is speculated that young Master Lin won't let them off easily due to this change in circumstances. Then, Lin Jiahao questions Chen about his lack of stones, asking if he has given up and not picked any. Lin Jiahao then showcases three small stones, claiming that they may be small in size but are the best ones. He proceeds to insult Chen, referring to him as the incompetent husband of the Mu family and mocking his unique preferences. As a host, Lin Jiahao allows Chen to open his stones first. The gossip among the people resumes, and someone comments on the small size of Chen's stones, speculating that even if they contain jade, they won't be worth much. Another person suggests that young Master Lin seems confident about winning the game already. The shop owner begins cutting the stones as part of the gambling game. Chen excitedly informs Shi Xue that his stone is jade. However, to his surprise, when the stone is cut, it turns out to be a useless stone. Next, the shop owner proceeds to cut Lin Jiahao's first stone. It is revealed to be a perfect emperor jade, which is highly valuable. Lin Jiahao then mocks Shi Xue, insinuating that there is no need to continue the game. He suggests that a moment of youthful passion, referring to their relationship is worth a fortune and advises Shi Xue to stop wasting time and obediently follow him home. Shi Xue responds to Lin Jiahao, questioning his impatience, and stating that the game has not yet ended. As the shop owner proceeds to cut Lin Jiahao's other two stones, both turn out to be jade, further increasing the value of his collection. Upon seeing the impressive value of Lin Jiahao's stones, someone remarks that the total estimated price of young Master Lin's three stones is 30 million. Another person suggests to Chen that there is no need to continue cutting his stones, implying that it is pointless. However, Chen insists that they proceed and asks the shop owner to cut his stones. Unfortunately, Chen's second stone also turns out to be useless. However, when the shop owner cuts Chen's third stone, he is taken aback as it is revealed to be a valuable bloodstone, surprising everyone present. Lin Jiahao becomes frustrated and refuses to accept that he has lost the bet to Chen. He fails to believe that Chen's stone is more valuable than his own. In response, Chen asks Shi Xue to appraise the stone. Shi Xue estimates its value to be around 100 million and suggests that to someone who appreciates the stone, its worth is priceless. Mocking Lin Jiahao, Chen exclaims that he has won with his stone valued at 100 million against Lin Jiahao's 30 million. He taunts Lin Jiahao, saying that someone has to kneel down and address him as grandpa. However, Lin Jiahao stubbornly refuses to comply. Suddenly, an unforeseen event occurs, and Lin Jiahao is forced to kneel in front of Chen, 
resulting in his teeth falling out. Seizing the opportunity, Chin continues to mock Lin Jiahao, stating that he fell so hard that he can't even speak clearly. Chin sarcastically suggests that Lin Jiahao doesn't need to call him grandpa, as he doesn't want a grandson as ugly as him. Chen and Shu Xue try to leave with the stone they won, but they are suddenly stopped by some people. Shu Xue asks Lin Jiahao why they are being stopped. Lin Jiahao responds by saying that he doesn't mean any harm, but they can only leave after leaving the stone behind. Shu Xue becomes furious and accuses Lin Jiahao of being shameless and engaging in lowly behavior. She questions if he is trying to become a robber. Lin Jiahao counters by saying that although Shu Xue bought the stone, she hasn't paid for it yet, so he considers it still to belong to him. He refuses to sell it now and mocks if the Mu family is trying to become robbers themselves. Shu Xue reminds him of the rules of the stone gambling they played. But in response, Chen simply tells them to take the stone. Shu Xue is confused by Chen's actions and questions when he gave the stone to Lin. Chen reassures her, saying not to worry and that he will choose better stones for her. Lin Jiahao becomes delighted, realizing the value of the priceless treasure he now possesses. He believes that with this treasure, the Lin family will achieve even greater heights, making his enemies look up to him. Lin Jiahao then orders his men to follow Shu Xue and Chen and buy every stone they pick. So, when Chen attempts to buy a stone, he is stopped and informed that Lin will be buying the stone instead. Chen pretends to be saddened by the situation and remarks that all the stones he has chosen have been purchased by young Master Lin. He sarcastically asks if Lin intends to follow him to the leftover stone area as well. Shu Xue expresses her concern to Jiang Chen, stating that even though Lin Jiahao shamelessly took away their stones, Chen should not give up on himself and buy a pile of trash. Chen reassures Shu Xue, telling her to trust him. He believes that if the Move family wants to achieve greater heights, they will have to rely on the seeming trash they have acquired in those few trucks. Curious about Chen's intentions, Shu Xue asks him what he plans to do. Chen advises her not to be impatient, assuring her that she will find out soon. In the meantime, the shop owner informs Lin Jiahao that all the stones brought back by his bodyguards have been cut, and disappointingly, they have turned out to be useless. Lin Jiahao becomes furious and accuses Jiang Chen of scamming him. He threatens that after the auction, he will personally take care of Chen. Lin believes that the stone he possesses will make the whole auction house go crazy and raise his status in the process. At the auction house, the host announces that the next item is the last and most precious one of the day, provided by young Master Lin of the Li family. It is a naturally formed, one-of-a-kind dragon-shaped bloodstone. The starting price is set at 300 million. Bidding starts, with someone offering 400 million, followed by another bid of 1 billion. Lin is pleased to see high bids and instructs to raise the price further, as he envisions the wealth contributing to the Lin family's rise as a major power. However, suddenly the bloodstone shatters, surprising everyone. The host immediately orders the bodyguards to lock down the auction house and pause the auction. Lin is shocked and devastated to witness the destruction of his prized stone. Lin Jiahao becomes furious and commands his men to find Jiang Chen and Shu Xue. He demands that they come out immediately, threatening to tear down the holiday villa if they don't comply. However, a man informs Lin that Shu Xue and her husband have already left the previous night. This news further infuriates Lin, blaming Chen and Shu Xue for making the Lin family a laughingstock in Jinling. He vows to pursue them and prevent them from living a peaceful life. Meanwhile, Chen sneezes, which catches Shu Xue's attention. She expresses concern, asking if he's alright and if he caught a cold. Chen playfully speculates that his sneeze might be a result of someone talking about him behind his back. Shu Xue notices her father's tension regarding the acquisition of raw materials for crafting gemstones. She expresses her hope to obtain good materials from the stones they have acquired. Chen reassures Shu Xue, promising not to disappoint her. Suddenly, a messenger arrives and urgently informs Chen about the stones. Shu Xue and her father quickly rush to see what has happened to the stones they purchased. They are shocked to discover that all the stones have turned out to be jade. Chen confidently states, Darling, I told you I wouldn't disappoint you. Overwhelmed with gratitude, Shu Xue embraces Chen and expresses her thanks for everything he has done for the Mu family. She apologizes for doubting him in the past. Shu Xue's father expresses admiration and praise for Chen, stating that he is like a lucky charm for the Mu family. Later that night, at the Mu family villa, Chen is engaged in cultivating his skills. He reflects on his previous training with the Basic Qi Cultivating Manual and notes that an average person would require three years to fully master the Purple Yang Celestial Deity technique. However, since he wholeheartedly rested for an entire night, he has noticed a significant increase in his training speed. Chen wonders if this improvement is due to his physique and contemplates trying another cultivation technique, 
such as the sky devouring mystic arts. He sees it as a technique that allows him to grow stronger by consuming, which he finds suitable for someone like him who tends to be lazy. Chin begins practicing the sky devouring mystic arts cultivation technique, focusing on filling his body's meridians with spiritual energy. However, his concentration is interrupted when Shushua enters his room and announces that she intends to sleep there. Chin is taken aback by the sudden change, but Shushua explains that as a couple, it is normal for them to share the same room. Shushua expresses her gratitude towards Chin, acknowledging the significant help he has provided to the Mu family. She suggests that her father's previous statement about Chin being the family's lucky charm might hold some truth. Chen, feeling pleased, responds to Shushua, expressing his agreement and saying that she asked for this arrangement willingly. As Chen and Shushua are about to engage in a physical encounter, Chen's thoughts take an unexpected turn. He perceives Shushua's body as food and comments internally. It smells delicious. However, this thought immediately alarms him, causing him to question himself. Wait. What was I thinking? What do I mean by delicious? This realization prompts Chen to abruptly stop, leaving Shushua curious about his sudden change in behavior. Meanwhile, a red-haired girl contemplates Chen's absence and expresses her disappointment, noting that he hasn't come to see her despite his return. Just as Chen abruptly stands up and starts running without explaining himself, the red-haired girl witnesses his panic state and jokingly asks if he is being chased by a ghost. She then approaches Shushua and asks if Jiang Chen, referring to Chen, has bullied her again, offering to find him on her behalf. Shushua responds, saying that Chen left without doing anything to her. Shushua misunderstood the situation and began to contemplate, wondering, could it be that he doesn't like me at all? He should at least pretend. Meanwhile, Chen, feeling perplexed, questioned himself, thinking, Damn it! Just a moment ago, I wanted to eat Shushua. Next, Chen is seen by some maids in front of a door in the morning. They notice his unusual behavior and ask what happened to him. Chen, sensing his strange cravings and wanting to protect the maids, warns them to stay away from him and not come near. However, Chen's thoughts betray his inner struggle as he contemplates the maids, thinking, I want to eat them up. They smell delicious. This thought reveals his growing hunger and disturbing desire to consume the maids. The maids, frightened by Chen's behavior and remarks, decide it's best to leave the situation quickly, expressing concern about his strange actions. Meanwhile, Chen tries to make sense of his condition and reflects on his hunger and loss of control. He suspects that there may be something wrong with the sky devouring mystic arts, the cultivation technique he has been practicing. Chen realizes that these techniques may have led to his abnormal cravings and potentially dangerous behavior. Chen, realizing the potential danger of his uncontrollable cravings, decides that it would be best to isolate himself in a room. He acknowledges that he might accidentally bite people if he can't control himself, and wants to avoid any troublesome situations. While in the room, Chen notices a computer and due to his distorted appetite, feels a strange desire to eat it along with the books in the room. His abnormal cravings seem to extend beyond just food. Suddenly, the red-haired girl enters the room and accuses Chen of hiding there. She confronts him, mentioning how he had bullied the young lady the previous night. Observing Chen's discomfort as he holds his stomach, she questions him about his actions. Chen, taken aback by the accusation, asks if there is a problem. The red-haired girl informs him that the young lady has been sulking since morning and inquires about what he did the previous night, suggesting that his actions may have upset or hurt the young lady. Chen confronts the red-haired girl, cornering her against the wall. He asks if she approached him solely because of the young lady, or if she has any intentions of pleasing him. His words suggest a provocative and inappropriate tone. The red-haired girl responds with disbelief, questioning the nonsense he is speaking and informing him that the CEO is looking for him. Chen, undeterred by her response, acknowledges that he is aware of the CEO's search for him but proceeds to make an unsettling comment about her scent, implying a desire to consume or harm her. Outraged, she denounces him as a pervert and expresses her disbelief that the young lady could have any fondness for him. She warns Chen that if he were to mistreat the young lady again, she would physically confront and fight him. Later, Chen approaches Shushua's father and inquires if he was seeking him. Upon seeing Chen, Shushua tells her father that she will leave if there is no further business or matter to attend to, implying her intention to depart from the situation. Chen attempts to prevent Shushua from leaving, but she dismisses him by using the excuse of being busy and bids him farewell. Shushua's father takes the opportunity to address Chen, stating that it is the right time for him to take action. He suggests that Chen has been at home for too long and should return to school to pursue his studies. Shushua's father introduces Professor Han, a man wearing glasses, 
who has prepared a test paper to determine Chen's appropriate starting grade. It is mentioned that Professor Han is aware of Chen's lack of prior schooling, so the test questions will not be excessively difficult. Shi Xue's father encourages Chen not to feel pressured. Chen examines the question paper and finds it intriguing. He acknowledges that he has never attended school before and considers it an interesting opportunity to give it a try. Chen surprises Professor Han with his answers to the test questions. The professor is shocked to see that Chen has answered everything correctly, even including some university-level questions. He finds it unbelievable that someone who hasn't attended school before could perform so well. This realization prompts Chen to attribute his success to the sky-devouring mystic arts, as he believes that he can gain knowledge from the items he consumes. He expresses gratitude for having recently eaten a row of books and a computer, which he believes contributed to his newfound intelligence. Professor Han is impressed by Chen's intelligence and talent, and he informs Shi Xue's father, Mr. Mu, about Chen's exceptional abilities. He suggests that Chen should be allowed to attend the university where Professor Han is lecturing. Professor Han requests Mr. Mu's permission for Chen to start attending the university the following day. Mr. Mu responds with laughter and agrees, giving his approval for Chen to pursue his studies at the university. The next morning, Chen arrives at the university and takes in the surroundings, particularly admiring the scenery and the presence of attractive girls. He humorously comments that it feels like heaven in that regard. However, his attention is drawn to a commotion where he overhears someone threatening another person. Chen expresses surprise that there are troublemakers even in the university setting. He notices a girl who is being harassed by a group of bullies. The girl pleads with them, asking for more time to repay the money she owes and promising to return it. One of the bullies responds harshly, suggesting that she can repay the debt by offering her body. Chin observes the situation and finds the behavior of the bullies to be excessively cruel. He believes that the girl is someone who borrows money and indulges in excessive consumption, implying that she may have a habit of overspending or mismanaging her finances. Chen's remark reflects his disapproval of the bullies' actions and hints at his intention to intervene and teach them a lesson. Chen senses the presence of a martial artist nearby. The girl, recognizing Chen's presence, appeals to him for assistance in her predicament, likely seeking his help against the bullies. However, one of the bullies issues a warning to Chin, highlighting the girl's debt to them and advising him to stay out of their affairs. So, Chin starts to get away from the place. The girl, disappointed and frustrated with Chen's decision to leave, confronts him by questioning his lack of compassion in the face of witnessing her being bullied. She implies that a real man would feel compelled to help and protect a girl in distress. Chin then asks the girl why should he save her. The girl confronts Chen about his apparent lack of conscience and asks him why he didn't intervene when she was being bullied by two gangsters. Chen defends his decision by highlighting the risks involved in taking on the bullies. He points out that the two individuals were physically larger than him and armed with weapons, implying that his own safety would have been compromised. Chen then brings up his elderly parents, indicating that he has responsibilities towards them and cannot afford to put himself in harm's way. Furthermore, Chen puts some blame on the girl herself suggesting that her current predicament may be a consequence of her own actions. He points out her branded clothes as a sign of extravagant spending and implies that she may have taken a loan, which has led to her debt and subsequent bullying. Hearing Chin, one of the bullies defends their actions, stating that it's normal to pay back debts. Chin, still waiting for the hidden martial artist to reveal himself, expresses his frustration and sarcastically wonders if the martial artist wants to make a grand entrance and be perceived as a superhero by the girl. Suddenly, a man wearing sunglasses appears and questions the two bullies for bullying a woman. One of the bullies dismissively challenges the man, telling him to leave. However, the man wearing sunglasses swiftly attacks one of the bullies with a punch. Observing the turn of events, Shin cynically comments on the situation, referring to it as the cliché the hero rescues the damsel trope. He appears unimpressed by the man's actions, deeming him boring and trash, possibly due to his preconceived notions or expectations. After the man, named Xiao Selong, successfully saves the girl, she expresses her gratitude and addresses him by name. Xiao Selong responds, assuring her that her safety is what matters to him. Upon witnessing their interaction, Chen makes a judgmental remark, suggesting that the girl and Xiao Selong are similar in some way, possibly implying that they are both uninteresting or unimpressive to him. Selong confronts Chen, accusing him of ignoring the girl's distress earlier. The girl takes advantage of the situation and asks Selong to teach Chen a lesson, emphasizing that Chen not only ignored her but also mocked her. The girl hands Selong a knife, instructing him to use it to teach Chen a lesson. Selong accepts the knife and charges Chen, stating that since Chen didn't want to save the girl earlier, no one will come to save him now. However, as Selong approaches Chen, 
the knife in his hand mysteriously disappears. Chen reveals that he has consumed the knife, displaying a demonic appearance and asserting his dominance. He confronts Selong, expressing his outrage at Selong's attempt to wield a blade in front of him and declares that he was hungry anyway. Witnessing Chen's transformation and fearing his demonic presence, both the girl and Selong become scared. Frightened Selong, realizing his ignorance, apologizes to Chen and pleads for forgiveness. Selong realizes that Chen possesses superior strength and is likely an expert at least two levels higher than him in the Huajin realm. Fearing Chen's power, Selong decides that he must escape. Chen, on the other hand, kicks Selong and chastises him for interfering and getting involved. Chen accuses Selong of pretending to have a moral high ground and suggests that he should have focused on his own romantic pursuits instead. Chen expresses his dislike for Selong and warns him not to be seen again, threatening to step on him every time they cross paths. Turning his attention to the girl, Chen acknowledges her presence. The girl, speaking in a frightened voice, claims to be an innocent victim. In response, Chen dismisses her, stating that he doesn't want to dirty his hands with her. After Chen leaves, the bullies once again capture the girl, continuing their harassment. Later, when Chen returns home after school, he carries flowers and begins searching for Shushue. He encounters his father-in-law and Shushue, and his father-in-law greets him, asking how his first day at school went. Chen responds, stating that it was quite interesting, with intriguing incidents and people. He then approaches Shushue, kneels down, and presents the flowers to her, asking if she likes them. Shushue, however, expresses her disinterest in flowers. Chen reassures her that it's all right and promises to bring her different gifts next time if she doesn't want flowers. He suggests options like cakes or perfumes. Shushue dismisses his offer, saying she doesn't want to waste her time and needs to go to work. Chen becomes saddened by her response, realizing that he shouldn't have gotten out of bed halfway. He wonders when she will stop being angry with him. After hearing Mu Tian's remark about young couples having fights, Chen seeks advice from him, asking if he has any tips. Mu Tian responds by saying that Chen has to learn the ways on his own. As Chen departs, Shushua returns and picks up the flowers that she had previously thrown away. She looks at them and thinks to herself, relieved, that she didn't break them. Next, in the school canteen, Chen continues to eat voraciously, drawing the attention of the other students. As he indulges in the food, he reflects on how he can finally satisfy his appetite, noting that the food in the canteen is enjoyable. Suddenly, a purple-haired boy approaches a girl and offers her a substantial amount of money, suggesting that she becomes his girlfriend in exchange. He addresses her as senior sister Faye and emphasizes that he knows she is in urgent need of money. Another boy chimes in, boasting about the purple-haired boy's wealthy father, who recently acquired an oil field in Arab. He suggests that if the girl becomes Brother Qian's girlfriend, she won't have to worry about money anymore, as his family's wealth surpasses ordinary monetary means. In the bustling canteen, an observer shares information about Fei Lui, highlighting her exceptional beauty and her family's financial struggles. They mention that her father has been bettered in for 15 years, implying the difficulties they face. Despite her immense popularity, she has never accepted any help or proposals from her admirers. Among them, Zhou Feiqian, a wealthy individual from a privileged background, has set his sights on her, but his reputation is not favorable. As the scene unfolds, Chin continues to eat his meal, discreetly observing everything happening around him. The girl rejects his offer. The purple-haired boy persists in his pursuit, questioning Fei Lui's rejection. He wonders if the money he offered is insufficient. Fei Lui responds with a straightforward answer, stating, Sorry, you're too ugly. The purple-haired boy is taken aback by Fei Lui's blunt rejection, while Chin, nearby, finds amusement in the situation. Chin, unfiltered and with a hint of sarcasm, mocks the boy's wealth, suggesting he should consider using his money for cosmetic enhancements. This remark stirs anger within the purple-haired boy, who charges Chin, demanding an apology and threatening physical harm. However, Chin effortlessly repels the boy's attack, causing him to be forcefully expelled from the canteen. Chen's nonchalant response reveals his lack of interest in the altercation, stating that the commotion disrupts his meal. Undeterred, the purple-haired boy, seeking revenge, urges his friends to join him in attacking Chen. He offers them a financial incentive, promising a reward of 10,000 for each person who participates in beating Chen, and an additional 100,000 if someone manages to render him unconscious. The students, tempted by the monetary incentive, accept the purple-haired boy's offer. In an attempt to justify their actions, they assure Chen that their involvement is solely motivated by the promise of money and request that he doesn't hold any grudges against them. Chin, undeterred by the threats and monetary offers from the purple-haired boy and his followers, calmly makes a phone call, 
informing the person on the other end of his location in the school canteen. The purple-haired boy, misunderstanding the purpose of the call, taunts Chin, suggesting that he is calling for reinforcements out of fear. Chin dismisses the notion, expressing his disinterest in using money as an advantage in such situations. A voice from the crowd, sensing the wealth and influence of Zhou Feiqian's family, advises Chin to simply apologize and avoid further confrontation. It seems to be a pragmatic suggestion, considering the disparity in social standing and resources. However, the atmosphere changes abruptly as two men dressed in black arrive at the scene, carrying bags with them. Their arrival introduces an air of uncertainty and suspense to the situation. People remark that it's unusual to see bodyguards at a school and question why someone would bring them there. As the two men in black kneel before Chin and confirm that they have brought what he ordered, the onlookers express surprise and curiosity. Chin, unfazed by the attention, confidently asserts that using money as an advantage is dull because it is already within his expertise. This statement leaves the purple-haired boy and his friends astonished, as they cannot comprehend how someone they consider a peasant could possess such wealth and influence. Taking advantage of the shift in dynamics, Jim boldly announces that he will double the reward for anyone who can defeat the purple-haired boy. The people who were initially hesitant or motivated by money now align themselves with Chen and charge at the purple-haired boy, ready to confront him. Meanwhile, as Chen walks through the school corridor, his thoughts shift to his interrupted meal at the canteen. He realizes he didn't have enough food due to the altercation. However, his mood brightens when he spots a computer room, sparking a sense of excitement within him. After some time a teacher arrives at the door of the computer room, she addresses the students and informs them that they will be covering a new topic in today's computer class. With anticipation, she opens the door, however, to her surprise, she discovers that there isn't a single computer present. Next, as the teacher continues with the class, Chen's attention drifts away from the lesson. Instead, he finds himself preoccupied with his thoughts on the school's subpar computer specifications. Comparing them to his father-in-law's superior and exquisite computer, he can't help but feel dissatisfied. However, his discontent takes a sudden turn when he starts feeling discomfort in his stomach. Sensing something amiss, Chen realizes that he might be experiencing a stomach ache. Astonishingly, he muses about the possibility of his discomfort being a result of consuming computers, likening the sensation to a tumultuous tsunami brewing within his stomach. To his surprise, a peculiar blue light emanates from his abdominal region. Intrigued and bewildered, Chen ponders the meaning behind this unexpected occurrence. Despite having consumed only a few computers, he notices the formation of an energy vortex in his dantian, a region within the body associated with energy cultivation in certain martial arts practices. As the teacher's attention is drawn to Chin, she recognizes him and calls him by name, asking him to come forward and respond. However, Chen, still suffering from a stomach ache, finds it challenging to concentrate. The discomfort in his stomach hinders his ability to focus on the teacher's question. A bespectacled boy in the class takes the initiative and volunteers to answer instead. He informs the teacher. Teacher, he doesn't know how T.O. solve it. Let me do it instead. The teacher agrees to this proposal, allowing the boy, Yu Chenhui, to provide the explanation. While Yu Chenhui proceeds with the explanation, Chen's mind wanders, and a strong urge to punch him surfaces within Chen's thoughts. However, he refrains from acting on this impulse and remains quiet. Once Yu Chenhui finishes his explanation, the teacher commends his answer praising his performance and mentioning his first place ranking on the school test. Turning her attention towards Chin, the teacher expresses her bewilderment at how he managed to gain admission to the school. She emphasizes that since he is enrolled, he should listen attentively and refrain from engaging in frivolous behavior. Chen retorts to the teacher, stating that he is merely experiencing a stomach ache and questions how that qualifies as playing around. In his thoughts, Chen perceives the teacher's actions as intentional opposition against him as if she is deliberately targeting him. The boy with glasses takes advantage of the situation to insult Chen further, referring to him as the infamous idiot from Hongxi village. He accuses Chen of using excuses instead of admitting his inability to answer the question. This leads to the students engaging in gossip and expressing their disgust at how someone they consider an idiot managed to secure admission to the university. They also express their frustration at the perceived privileges that rich people possess, allowing them to do as they please. These derogatory remarks directed at Chen fuel his desire for revenge. In an act of revenge, Chen releases a fart and swiftly places the blame on the boy with glasses, Yu Chenhui. Pointing directly at him, Chen exclaims that the smell is unbearable and questions how Yu Chenhui's fart could be so potent. The other students join in, chastising Yu Chenhui for being inconsiderate and creating such a foul odor. Yu Chenhui vehemently denies the accusation, 
exclaiming that it's complete nonsense and that he didn't do it. In response, the students quickly flee the classroom, seeking relief from the unpleasant smell. The teacher, affected by the noxious gas, ends up vomiting. One concerned student asks Teacher Li what happened, and another student attributes it to Yu Chenhui's fart, prompting the evacuation of the students. Realizing that Yu Chenhui is still inside the classroom, a teacher rushes back in to rescue him. Once outside, the teacher informs others that the fart was exceptionally powerful, causing Yu Chenhui to faint due to its intensity. Amidst the mocking and gossiping, a student sarcastically comments on Yu Chenhui's apparent talent, jokingly suggesting that he must have consumed some strange memory-enhancing medicine. The student advises others to stay away from Yu Chenhui, emphasizing the seriousness of being caught in his fart. Observing the situation, Chen approaches Yu Chenhui with a devious plan in mind. He resolves to manipulate the misunderstanding and make everyone believe that Yu Chenhui was indeed responsible for the foul odor. Chen eagerly anticipates how this will diminish Yu Chenhui's arrogance in the future. Lost in thought, Chen ponders the cultivation technique known by Ji Yang Tianzuin, contemplating how it could enable the release of such a potent bioweapon after ingestion. He deems it a sinister ability. Just then, Chen's phone rings, indicating an incoming call from Shushua. Upon answering the call from Shushua, Chen's initial cheerfulness turns into a blank expression upon hearing the sudden news. Something serious seems to have occurred. In a hurry, Chen rushes home and immediately seeks information from Shushua about the situation. Concerned, he asks about the well-being of his father-in-law, hoping to understand the gravity of the situation. Shushua reveals that her father has been kidnapped, but the kidnappers have not made any monetary demands or specified their intentions. However, they explicitly mention Chen as the target. Witnessing the distress of Shushua's mother, who pleads tearfully for Chen to save his father-in-law, Chen is overwhelmed with a mix of emotions. He contemplates the possible reasons behind the kidnapping, considering the numerous people he has offended or crossed paths with. The incident seems to be a result of his own actions, and he wonders which of his enemies is responsible for this latest ordeal. Suddenly a man rushes in with alarming news about a crowd gathering at their company building and demanding a refund for a flawed ointment. Jin quickly realizes that this was all part of a plan to divert attention while kidnapping his father-in-law. Determined to resolve both the kidnapping and the company issue, he instructs Shushua to handle the crowd at the entrance while he focuses on saving her father. However, Shushua stops Jin, concerned that they haven't been given any information about the location of her father. In response, Jin confidently reassures her, expressing his self-assurance and implying that he has a plan in mind. At a deserted hill, Shushua's father remains captive and contemplates the worry his family must be experiencing upon learning about his kidnapping. Suddenly, he hears Chen's voice, apologizing for his delay and acknowledging the hardships his father-in-law must have endured. However, Shushua's father, aware of the danger, warns Chen against coming any closer, recognizing that it is a trap set for him. As Chen arrives at the location and calls out for the kidnappers to reveal themselves, one of them emerges and acknowledges his bravery for coming alone. However, Upon seeing the kidnappers, Chen becomes angry, likely due to their actions and the threat they pose. Amidst the tense situation, Mu Tian, Shushua's father, raises his voice, urging Chen to run away quickly. He warns Chen that the kidnappers have already managed to defeat his bodyguards, implying that Chen is no match for them. The kidnappers, feeling confident, mock Chen and declare their intent to prevent his escape and kill him. Sensing the danger, Chen decides to put on an act, pretending to be fearful and pleading for his life. He emphasizes that he is an ordinary person who has yet to consummate his marriage and fulfill his familial responsibilities of giving his parents a grandson. One of the kidnappers, curious about Chen's sudden change in demeanor, reflects on how their informant, Xiao Selong, had described Chen as an arrogant person. They question why Chen is now trembling in fear upon encountering them. However, another kidnapper remains cautious, suggesting that Chen might be playing a trick or attempting to deceive them. This prompts the kidnapper to propose testing Chen to verify the truth of his behavior. He then tells Chen to leave his one arm and one leg if he wants to live. In response to the kidnapper's demand for Chen to leave one arm and one leg behind to stay alive, Chen pleads for mercy, highlighting the impossibility of engaging in intimate relations with his wife if he were to lose his limbs. The kidnapper, displaying arrogance, dismisses the importance of Chen's wife, suggesting that she should be left for them to enjoy. As the kidnapper charges toward Chen, he effortlessly catches the attacker's sword with just two fingers. Chen then retaliates by delivering a powerful punch and expresses his anger toward the kidnapper. He berates the kidnapper for taking his previous act seriously and daring to covet his wife, wishing the attacker to go to hell. Observing Chen's display of strength and skill, the other kidnapper acknowledges that Xiao Selong was correct in advising against underestimating Chen. 
Recognizing the threat, the second kidnapper suggests joining forces with the first kidnapper, planning to combine their swords in an attempt to overcome Chin. The kidnappers combine their swords, proudly declaring themselves as the mystic sword duo and expressing their confidence in defeating Chin. However, Chin effortlessly dodges their attack and even manages to balance himself on their combined sword. Taking the opportunity to mock them, Chen mentions Xiao Selong, whom he refers to as a coward from the school forest, implying that he is familiar with their martial brotherhood. Chen belittles their skills, suggesting that their incompetence is a direct result of their association with Xiao Selong. Curious about their motive, Chen asks who instructed them to provoke trouble with the Mu family. One of the kidnappers admits that it was indeed Brother Xiao who sought revenge after being defeated by Chen. Unsatisfied with this answer, Chin decides to teach one of the kidnappers a lesson and warns the other kidnapper that he has limits to his patience. Fearing the consequences, the remaining kidnapper reveals the complete truth, succumbing to Chen's intimidation. After rescuing Mu Tian and bringing him home along with the kidnappers, Chen receives a warm welcome from Shushua and her mother. Concerned about Mu Tian's well-being, Shushua's mother asks if he was harmed during the kidnapping. Mu Tian reassures her that he is fine and expresses his gratitude to Chin for saving him. In the midst of the reunion, Chin takes charge and instructs his men to escort the two kidnappers to the underground basement, emphasizing that they still have some usefulness to him. This decision raises questions from Shushue, who wonders why Chin is sparing the individuals responsible for her father's abduction. She also mentions the ongoing problem at the company building, where people are still blocking the entrance and refusing to leave despite her father's return. Chin comforts Shushue, assuring her that she doesn't need to take any action regarding the situation. Recognizing her recent exhaustion from work, he encourages her to rest and assures her that he will handle everything. Chin expresses his determination to seek justice for the mistreatment she has endured, vowing to make those responsible regret their actions towards his wife. In the midst of the chaos outside the MU family's company, a crowd gathers to express their grievances, accusing the company of selling counterfeit medicine and demanding refunds. The situation gains attention on social media as well, with people condemning the company for allegedly selling fake and harmful products. Reporters present on the scene note that the Qinxian Corporation, the company in question, has yet to respond to the allegations, promising to provide updates on the situation. Meanwhile, at a restaurant, the person responsible for orchestrating the turmoil, under the orders of Shah, leisurely observes the unfolding events on television, while enjoying food and drinks. Pleased with the performance of the paid actors causing the commotion, he decides to offer them additional compensation. However, just as he receives a call from Shah, a sudden blackout occurs, plunging the surroundings into darkness. Perplexed by the sudden power outage, he questions the situation. Within the darkness, his men are unexpectedly attacked and beaten. Concerned for their well-being, he inquires about their condition. One of his men responds, indicating that someone is physically assaulting them. Attempting to gain some visibility, he resorts to using his phone's flashlight to assess the situation and understand what is happening in the darkness. As the electricity is restored, the man realizes that all of his men are lying unconscious on the ground. To his surprise, Chen emerges from behind, requesting a favor and asking him to make a phone call to his boss. The man is taken aback by Chen's sudden appearance and the situation at hand. Later, at the Mu family house, a report is delivered to Shushue, who is addressed as manager Mu. The report states that the crowd outside the company has dispersed, much to their astonishment. The troublesome individuals refuse to leave despite offers of money and even threats. Shushua wonders if someone secretly helped them, and she feels a sense of happiness, knowing that Chin was behind the resolution of the crisis. On the second day, Chin is seen walking on the road, contemplating the recent events. Although he successfully resolved the crisis involving the Qinxian Corporation, he recognizes that the root cause remains unresolved with the Xia and Gu families being responsible. Chen acknowledges that while it would be easy for him to eliminate them, the aftermath and the attention he would attract pose challenges. Aware of the existence of other sects and the potential for powerful experts, Chen decides it is wiser to manipulate others into removing the Gu and Xia families. He believes that soon, a key person who will aid the Mu family in overcoming this crisis will make an appearance. As if fulfilling Chen's thoughts, an important-looking elderly man named Hua Jianlong suddenly appears, catching Chen's attention. Chen recognizes Hua Jianlong, an influential figure in the military and a distinguished alumnus of Qianchuan University. His attention then turns to a girl accompanying Hua Jianlong, speculating that she might be his granddaughter. Chen is captivated by her beauty, considering her a potential rival to the most beautiful student at the university. However, he quickly regains focus, reminding himself of the task at hand. At Lover's Hill, 
The girl inquires if this is the place where her grandparents first met. Hua Jiangwang confirms it, reminiscing about her grandmother, who was once the smartest and prettiest girl at Qianchuan University. Chen, observing them from behind a tree, realizes they are alone and sees this as an opportunity. He contemplates how to approach them strategically. Meanwhile, the old man becomes lost in his memories, experiencing discomfort in his heart. Sensing his distress, the girl asks if his heart condition has recurred. However, before she can comprehend the situation fully, the old man faints, leaving her concerned and seeking answers. Chen, who had been waiting for an opportunity to approach Hua Jianlong and his granddaughter, sees the old man faint and believes that the timing is in his favor. However, his plans are interrupted by the arrival of another old man wearing glasses. The newcomer assures the girl that he can save her grandfather, claiming to have coincidentally witnessed the unfortunate incident. Chin is taken aback by the presence of this unknown man, questioning his identity and why he is interfering in his plan. The girl, on the other hand, considers the man's appearance as fate, believing that he is destined to cure her grandfather. She offers a handsome reward if he can successfully treat him. Without wasting time, the man instructs the girl to lay her grandfather down, expressing his readiness to cure him. As he begins to recite an incantation or spell, Chin watches closely, skeptical of the man's intentions. However, he suddenly senses a familiar energy emanating from the man, one that resembles Ji Yang Tianjun's power. After realizing that the man with glasses possesses the same energy as Ji Yang Tianjun, Chin deduces that he may also come from the Qianlong continent. He ponders whether this man is the only one from their homeland and notes that his aura surpasses his own in strength. Feeling overpowered, Chin decides to leave the scene promptly. As he observes the campus, Chin notices an ambulance present and wonders why it has arrived. Soon, two men step out of the ambulance and confront the man with glasses, identifying him as Wang Quan and accusing him of scamming people once again. They inform the girl that Wang Quan is a patient from their hospital, implying that he suffers from mental health issues. Despite being taken away forcefully by the two men, Wang Quan reassures the girl that he has stabilized her grandfather's heart and that someone will soon come to save him. He assures her that, with this person's assistance, her grandfather will remain healthy for another hundred years. However, the men dismiss Wang Quan's claims and inform the girl not to trust him, recounting a previous incident where he attempted to help a pregnant woman give birth. Devastated by the realization that she believed in a mentally unstable individual, the girl breaks down in tears, lamenting the potential delay in her grandfather's treatment caused by her misplaced trust in Wang Quan. As Chin observes the girl crying and expressing her hope for the arrival of the ambulance, he contemplates the situation. He concludes that the man with glasses, Wang Quan, is not a mental patient, as his aura surpassed Chen's own and he even predicted Chen's appearance, indicating a higher cultivation level. Approaching the girl, Chen offers his assistance, sensing the dire condition of the old man. However, the girl, while briefly finding Chen handsome, remembers not to be deceived by appearances and declines his help, stating that she has already called the ambulance. Undeterred, Chen insists that ordinary hospitals cannot handle the old man's illness and that only he can cure him. Despite his explanations, the girl remains skeptical and asks him to leave. Eventually, the ambulance arrives and the medical staff instructs unrelated individuals to leave as they prepare to transport the patient. Before departing, Chen introduces himself as Jiang Chun and informs the girl to seek him out if she ever needs his help. As the ambulance departs, Chen laments that the girl mistook him for another scammer due to Wang Quan's actions, thus thwarting his plan. After Chen's evening class, he is approached by a man with eccentric hair who halts him. Curious, Chen inquires about the reason for being stopped. The man apologizes for his previous offense and extends an invitation to a banquet that he has arranged, intending to make amends. Chin dismisses him, deeming him unworthy of his attention. However, the man persistently pleads with Chen, addressing him as Brother Chin, and expressing his remorse. He begs for a chance to rectify his mistakes, revealing that Fei Loi will also be attending the banquet. Relenting slightly, Chen agrees, instructing the man to pick him up later that night. Delighted by Chen's acceptance, the man expresses gratitude, acknowledging Chen's grace. Yet, Chen curtly cuts him off, stating that he feels stressed from being in his presence, and instructs him to stop following him. As Chen departs, the man's demeanor undergoes a sinister transformation. Wearing an evil expression, he inwardly plots, relishing the anticipation of Chen's downfall. He vows to make Chen kneel before him tonight, confident in his malevolent intentions. In the evening, at a hotel, the man with eccentric hair, Chen, and a girl is present. The man addresses Chen, suggesting they raise their glasses for another toast. He expresses his honor at being able to meet Chen and proposes they enjoy the night together. 
Playfully, he asks Chin if he prefers males instead. The girl interjects, asserting her claim on Chin, telling the man to move out of the way as Chin belongs to her. The man then explains to Chin that Fei Lui cannot attend due to an urgent matter, requesting Chin not to hold it against him. Chen responds with a dry remark, expressing that it would have been more surprising if the man had actually succeeded in inviting Fei Lui. Suddenly, a group of men bursts into the scene, forcefully kicking a chair and proclaiming that the place is reserved for young Master Qin. They demand that everyone leave within a minute. The man with funky hair questions the identity of young Master Qin puzzled as to why he would claim the place when Boss Chin is already inside. One of the men who barged and forcefully grabs the man with funky hair by the neck and warns him to reconsider, asking him to think of anyone else in Xianchuan City who could be called young Master Qin. The man with funky hair, despite being choked, thinks to himself that the man lacks acting skills and is using excessive force. In response, the man with funky hair asks if they are referring to Qin Yu, the owner of Haina Properties. The man gripping his neck confirms that it is indeed Qin Yu and throws the funky-haired man to the ground. Realizing the severity of the situation, the funky-haired man hastily apologizes and promises to leave immediately. He approaches Chen and apologizes, suggesting they find another place to continue their gathering. Chen, however, sees no reason to leave, stating that he thinks the current place is suitable. The man with funky hair pleads with Chen, offering to find a better location, emphasizing the importance of not offending young Master Qin. Chen, displaying his fearless nature, responds to the mention of young Master Qin with indifference, stating that he doesn't care who he is and that it's a first-come, first-served situation. In response to Chen's dismissive attitude, the men in black become enraged and charge at him, threatening his life for daring to scold young Master Qin. Reacting swiftly, Chen hurls his glass at the approaching men, hitting them and momentarily subduing their aggression. One of the men, still recovering from the impact of the thrown glass, expresses his disbelief that Chen dared to fight back against them. Ultimately, the men in black decide to retreat and leave the premises. The man with funky hair takes the opportunity to inform Chen of his grave mistake, explaining that the man they angered is indeed young Master Qin of Haina Properties. He recounts incidents where others who merely glanced at his female partner ended up in the intensive care unit, and a merchant who sold him fake goods had his shop torn down and disappeared. Furthermore, a celebrity who offended him was forced to work without pay, cleaning toilets. Surprised by these accounts, Chen asks if young Master Qin is truly that malicious. The man with funky hair, unaware that young Master Qin is standing behind him, openly expresses his desire to scold and criticize him. He asserts that, despite Qin's tough demeanor, his true strength is inferior to Chen's by a significant margin. The man believes that Qin's reliance on his family's wealth will eventually lead to his downfall, and he suggests that it would be ideal for Chen and Qin to engage in a conflict with each other. Little does he know that Qin is standing right behind him, listening to his words. Upon discovering Qin's presence, the man becomes frightened and attempts to shift blame onto Qin, claiming that it was Qin who incessantly scolded Qin while he tried to intervene. Qin, however, sees through the man's lies and responds with anger, kicking him as a form of punishment. Qin accuses the man of speaking ill of him behind his back multiple times and asserts that he won't let him get away with it. Qin kicks him again, displaying his ruthless nature. Qin then proclaims that the man has lived for too long and declares that he should disappear from Qianchuan. The man pleads for forgiveness, but Qin shows no mercy. Qin orders his men to bring the man's entire family instructing them to use force against anyone who resists. The man is taken away by Qin's men, while Qin reassures the girl accompanying him that her family will be safe as long as she obeys him, attempting to console her despite the distressing situation. Qin confronts Qin and immediately recognizes him as Jiang Qin, the infamous husband of the Mu family in Qianchuan. Qin proceeds to insult Qin, mocking his marriage to Shi Xue and labeling him a coward. He taunts Qin, claiming that without the Mu family's support, Chen's only way out is by submitting to Qin's authority. Chen retaliates, daring Qin to mistreat him despite knowing his identity, and warning Qin about potential consequences from the Qinxian Corporation. Qin dismisses Chen's threats with laughter, asserting that the Qinxian Corporation might not even exist in a few days, implying that he holds significant power and influence. Chen, looking at his phone, mentions that news of the Qinxian Corporation's crisis has spread, suggesting that the corporation is facing significant challenges or potential collapse. Meanwhile, at St. Maria Hospital, a girl with pink hair, named Hua, questions the doctors about the condition of someone close to her. Frustrated with their response, Hua angrily berates the doctors, deeming them useless and expressing her disappointment in their efforts to cure the patient. Outside the hospital room, the girl with pink hair pleads with her grandfather, 
expressing her desire for him to stay alive and fulfill his promise of attending her wedding. Suddenly, she recalls Chin and realizes that he might be able to help save her grandfather's life. She urgently instructs her companion to find Chen and seek his assistance. Shortly afterward, Chin receives a call from an unknown number. Curious, he answers and inquires about the caller's identity. The person on the other end introduces herself as Hua Xiener, reminding Chin of their previous encounter earlier in the day. Hua explains that she believes Chin can save her grandfather, who is currently at St. Maria Hospital. However, before she can fully explain the situation, Chin interrupts angrily, threatening Chen with kneeling on glass shards for ignoring him. Chen, feeling trapped, informs Hua about the situation, expressing his fear of the consequences he might face. Hua, determined to help, asks who dares to make such demands and inquires about Chen's location. Just as Chen is about to disclose his address to Hua, Chen snatches the phone away, eager to see who Chen was speaking to. He taunts Chen, questioning if the caller is his girlfriend due to her youthful voice. On the phone, Hua queries Chen about his identity, prompting Chen to boast about himself in an arrogant manner. He proclaims himself as the mighty and powerful Chen Yu, located at Haiyu Buildings, and challenges Hua to come find him if she dares. Chen further warns her not to just talk without being prepared, as he claims to have fifty brothers waiting for her. Surprised by the abrupt disconnection, Chen questions Chen about Hua's audacity to hang up on him and her declaration of coming to find him. He resolves to prepare a grand reception to teach her a lesson. Chin then commands one of his men to set up a camera and fetch two bottles of drugged wine. His intention is to ensure that Hua regrets her decision to come to him. With an evil expression, he informs Chin that he will deal with Hua first. In response, Chen responds with sarcastic gratitude. After some time, a significant number of cars arrive at the location where Chin and Chin are. Hua arrives with her entourage and immediately asks for Chin Yu. Unaware of the impending danger, Chin is preoccupied with flirting and casually informs the girl present that another person will be arriving soon. He suggests having fun together. However, Hua enters the room and loudly demands to know who Chin Yu is. Chin, still attempting to flirt, asks if Hua was the one who called him, boasting about his appearance and insinuating that she should become his. His disrespectful behavior prompts someone to slap him forcefully. In shock and pain, Chin protests and calls for his bodyguards complaining about the slap and claiming that his hand is hurt. To his surprise, it was his father who struck him. Chin, fearing further punishment, tries to assert control by threatening to call his mother. However, his father, disappointed and angered by Chin's actions, continues to beat him, admonishing him for his spoiled upbringing and the trouble he has brought upon the family. After punishing Chin, his father approaches Hua and humbly pleads for forgiveness, acknowledging his failure to properly educate his son and accepting responsibility for the situation. Chin, still in a state of defiance, questions his father's actions and criticizes him for apologizing to Hua. In response, his father slaps him once again and scolds him for his insolence, demanding that he keep quiet and show respect. Observing the situation from the sidelines, Chin finds amusement in Chin's predicament and openly expresses his belief that Chin deserves the punishment he is receiving. Hearing this, Chin becomes enraged and charges at Chin, intending to retaliate. However, Chin's father intervenes once again and delivers another beating to his son, preventing him from attacking Chin. Chin, watching the scene unfold, comments that he doesn't even need to take any action, finding entertainment in the situation. Hua approaches Chin and questions whether he is satisfied with what he has witnessed. She urges him to accompany her back, warning him that if he fails to cure her grandfather, she will make him regret it. Chin, feeling a sense of urgency and fearing the consequences, reassures Hua that saving lives is of utmost importance. He agrees to go with her promptly, emphasizing the need to act swiftly and not waste any more time. At the hospital, Hua expresses her frustration with the doctor's inability to cure her grandfather and insists that they involve Chen and inform him about her grandfather's condition. One of the doctors questions whether Chen, who claims to have the ability to heal old man Hua, is trustworthy, considering his young age and lack of formal qualifications. The doctor wonders if Chen might be a fraud or a con man. One of the doctors recognizes Chin as an individual from Hongxi village and informs the others about his previous encounter with him. Another doctor points out that Mr. Fang, the hospital head and successor of Rakan Corporation, vouches for Chen's credibility. However, the hospital head is concerned about the potential consequences if something goes wrong with old man Hua's treatment, emphasizing the need to be cautious. Chin approaches the doctor and dismisses the need for introductions, reiterating that he is the only one capable of curing old man Hua. Hua, impatient and desperate to see her grandfather healed, shouts at Chen, urging him to stop wasting time and immediately begin the treatment. 
However, one of the doctors intervenes and advises Hua to wait, expressing doubt and caution, emphasizing that Chin is deemed unreliable due to his reputation as an idiot. Chin goes near the doctor and sarcastically addresses him, recognizing him as Mr. Stupid Fang, who is an admirer of Gu Anqi. Aware that Chin remembers his past attempts to pursue Gu Anqi and the nickname she gave him, the doctor becomes fearful, wondering if Chin remembers everything about his actions. The doctor then turns to Hua and dismissively comments that Chin is simply an unintelligent person who cannot even count to ten. He questions Chen's ability to cure diseases, but suggests that the symptoms exhibited by old man Hua resemble what he has read in ancient books. The doctor proposes to give it a try. Chin agrees with the doctor's suggestion, giving his consent to proceed. However, Hua becomes angry and objects to the doctor's plan. She criticizes Chin, expressing her disapproval and questioning whether he sees her grandfather as some kind of experimental subject. Chen reassures Hua, explaining that he has recently checked on her grandfather and confirms that he is all right. He warns Hua that if they don't let the doctor try to treat her grandfather, it may cause trouble for him during the healing process. Hua reluctantly agrees but warns Chen that if anything happens to her grandfather, there will be consequences. Chen then comforts Hua, assuring her that he won't let anything happen to old man Hua. In the ICU room, the doctor reassures Hua, stating that she can rest assured. He claims to have learned the Huayang acupuncture technique from an expert and asserts that he will definitely cure her grandfather. The doctor recalls that although the expert only taught him for three months due to his perceived lack of talent, he is determined to impress everyone once he successfully treats old man Hua. The doctor begins the treatment by reciting words like a spell and then carefully inserting needles into the old man's head and other areas. While treating the old man, the doctor focuses on his own aspirations, thinking that if he can successfully cure old man Hua, he will gain everything he desires. He disregards the identities of Gu Anqi and Xia Bai, determined to reclaim what he has lost. After completing the treatment, the doctor feels happy, realizing that old man Hua's symptoms align with the descriptions in the ancient book. Despite only having learned a small portion of the technique, he remains hopeful for a positive outcome. After some time, the old man awakens from his treatment, bringing happiness and relief to Hua as she sees her grandfather conscious. Meanwhile, other doctors praise and commend the doctor for the successful outcome. Witnessing the old man's awakening, the doctor can't contain his joy and triumph. He believes he has truly succeeded in saving old man Hua, and his thoughts are filled with a sense of accomplishment. He dismisses the significance of Gu Anqi, Xia Bai, and the expert who doubted him, considering them inconsequential. Hua, filled with hope and curiosity, asks her grandfather how he feels. The old man responds, expressing warmth and a renewed sense of vitality. While observing the interaction between Hua and Chen, doubt begins to creep into Hua's mind. She questions whether Jiang Chen might actually be a scammer. Meanwhile, the doctor, brimming with confidence, reinforces his claim to Hua that he can indeed cure old man Hua. He suggests that they should get rid of Chen, laughing with an evil expression. In his thoughts, he contemplates the possibility of old man Hua allowing his daughter to marry him as a form of gratitude, enabling him to take over the Hua family. Amidst the celebration of the doctor's successful treatment and Hua's joy over her grandfather's recovery, Chen interrupts them, nagging and cautioning them against celebrating too early. Chen confronts the doctor, attributing the worsening condition of old man Hua to his actions. He asserts that thanks to the doctor, old man Hua has not only failed to recover but has become even more endangered. In response, the doctor approaches Chen and dismisses his claims with laughter, mocking Chen as an idiot. He argues that old man Hua is actually feeling better emphasizing that it was fortunate they didn't allow Chen to intervene, as he would have only made the situation worse. Chen then directs attention to the old man, urging the doctor, Fang Qian, to open his eyes and witness the consequences of his actions. The doctor becomes shocked when he realizes that the old man's condition has indeed worsened. The needles the doctor had previously inserted into the old man have all been forcefully expelled. Filled with fear, the doctor tries to reassure himself, insisting that he had definitely succeeded. Chin takes the opportunity to taunt the doctor, sarcastically addressing him as Dr. Fang. He highlights that old man Hua could have had a longer lifespan if the doctor hadn't intervened in such a manner. Now, the disease has become even more complicated, creating significant trouble even for someone like Chin. The doctor, feeling cornered, challenges Chin by reminding him of his claim to be able to cure old man Hua. He taunts Chin, urging him to prove his ability by curing the old man now. Chen, in response, reminds the doctor that it was the doctor's actions that have worsened old man Hua's condition. To further intimidate the doctor, Chen recalls the doctor's previous desire to marry Hua. Attempting to shift the blame and escape responsibility, the doctor frames Chen, 
telling Hua that Chen had demanded her hand in marriage as a condition for curing old man Hua. He tries to discredit Chen's authority by stating that even if everyone in the room were to kneel before him, it would be of no use. Hua, outraged by the doctor's accusation, confronts Chen, expressing her anger and asking if he dares to threaten her. The doctor, with resentment towards Chen, resolves to drag him down even if it costs him his own life. Chen, unfazed by the doctor's threats, smiles and remarks that even tame dogs will attempt to bite when they are desperate. He pitifully acknowledges the doctor's actions. To counter the doctor's claims, Chen reveals that he has recorded their conversation and possesses evidence of every word the doctor has spoken since they entered the room. The doctor becomes frightened and accuses Chen of framing him. Overwhelmed by shock, the doctor loses consciousness. Approaching the unconscious doctor, Chin taunts him, expressing his disappointment in the doctor's lack of resilience. He admonishes the doctor for attempting to frame him, remarking on the doctor's naivety. Hua takes charge and instructs her servants to carry the doctor out of the room, effectively removing him from the situation. After resolving the commotion, Chin announces that he will now begin treating old man Hua. He dismisses everyone else, instructing them to leave the room. Hua, feeling confused, questions Chen about his earlier statement regarding her grandfather's worsened condition and his confidence in treating him. Chen clarifies that he only said those things to provoke Fang Qian, and assures Hua not to worry, promising to restore her grandfather's health. However, Hua, still wary from the previous events, warns Chen not to lie to her again, as her grandfather's frailty adds to her concern. Outside the ICU, other doctors express their doubts and inquire whether Chen will be like Fang Qian. Hua responds, stating that they have no choice but to trust Chen at this point. Inside the ICU, Chen, while treating the old man, realizes that in order to cure him, he needs to replenish his body with the purest life force, known as vitality. He understands that the human body possesses its own self-recovery mechanism, and if there is sufficient vitality, various diseases can heal on their own. With this in mind, Chen begins collecting vitality from the surrounding environment. Meanwhile, Hua and others in the vicinity start feeling dizzy likely due to the energy transfer taking place. Chin then channels the collected vitality into the old man's body, providing him with the necessary rejuvenation. After the treatment is complete, Chen reflects on the severity of the old man's condition, realizing that he required more vitality than anticipated. He acknowledges that the surrounding living beings may have been slightly affected by the energy extraction process and hopes that the people outside are unharmed. With the treatment finished, Chen invites everyone to enter the room. Overwhelmed with emotions, Hua bursts into tears upon seeing her grandfather. The old man reassures her, apologizing for causing her worry and expressing that he is now feeling well. He acknowledges the doctor's role in his recovery and urges Hua to properly thank him. Later that night at the casino, Chin observes the thriving atmosphere and reflects on his previous encounter with Xia Bai, realizing he should have taken more money from him. He notices that the casino has quickly regained its liveliness. Suddenly, Xia Bai enters the casino accompanied by Guan, and confronts Chin, stating that he is not welcome in any of his establishments. Guan mocks Chin, questioning how he has the leisure to visit casinos when he should be dealing with issues at his own company. Chin responds confidently, admitting that he hasn't resolved the problems at his company yet but expressing enjoyment in seeing his adversaries struggle. Xia Bai demonstrates his aggressive nature by physically assaulting one of his workers, slapping and kicking him. He then orders another person to call the police falsely claiming that someone is causing a disturbance and harming his employee. Approaching Chen, Xia Bai confronts him directly, expressing his desire to witness Chen's own struggles and downfall. Chen issues a warning to Xia Bai, offering him a chance to be spared from potential consequences. However, Xia Bai dismisses the warning, showing little concern and questioning Chen's authority. Suddenly, a man rushes in and informs Xia Bai that a large group of people has gathered at the entrance. Xiao Bai assumes it must be the police and welcomes their arrival. Outside the casino, Hua and her associates are present. Hua remarks that Chen arrived without informing anyone, implying his unexpected actions. Xiao Bai and Guan, accompanied by their own group, also make their way outside. Confused, Xiao Bai inquires about the identity of the people gathered, as it becomes evident that they are not the police. One of the men explains to Xiao Bai that these individuals are hostile and insist on finding Jiang Chen. At this moment, Chin himself emerges from the casino. Upon seeing Chin, Hua rushes towards him, but Xiao Bai intervenes, attempting to persuade her by introducing himself as the CEO of Ding Feng Corporation and the successor of the Xia family. He implies that she may have been deceived by Chen and suggests they go inside to have a discussion. Witnessing the situation unfold, Hua's bodyguard steps forward and firmly grabs Xia Bai, 
warning him not to lay a dirty hand on the young mistress. Guan becomes infuriated by this act and questions the bodyguard's behavior, considering it unreasonable. In response, Guan orders her people to attack the bodyguard. As a brawl ensues, Hua turns to Qin and questions why he left without informing anyone, expressing her grandfather's gratitude towards him. Qin explains that her grandfather's resilience played a significant role in his recovery. Despite Qin's explanation, Hua insists that he accompanies her to see her grandfather. Suddenly, a man is sent flying towards Hua, but Qin swiftly saves her from harm. Xiao Bai, in reaction, commands his people to call the police, but Hua's bodyguard declares that the police won't be coming as he now has control over the situation. Xia Bai is shocked by this revelation. Qin takes the opportunity to address Hua, understanding that she would feel burdened if he were to reject her gratitude and her grandfather's. He makes a request, stating that he will force himself to do so. Hua inquires about the request, and Qin approaches Xia Bai, asking him for help in eliminating all his enemies. Hua, surprised, questions if that's all Qin desires. Upon hearing Qin's request, he acknowledges the high status of the individuals he wants help with implying that it would be challenging to fulfill his request. This angers Xia Bai, who questions Chen's audacity despite being aware of his identity. Chen then reveals the identity of Hua, introducing her as the granddaughter of Old Man Hua, a name that strikes fear in Xia Bai and Guan. Feeling frightened, Xia Bai ponders the implications of encountering members from the influential Hua family. He realizes that the prolonged absence of the police may be due to the involvement of the Hua family, who possess the capability to challenge the Xia family. Xiao Bai contemplates the consequences of the crimes committed by the Xia family and the potential repercussions if the Hua family were to retaliate to shift blame. Xiao Bai decides to lay it all on the Gu family, thinking it is the only course of action. Xiao Bai directs his anger towards Guan, blaming her for the situation, and proceeds to slap her as a manifestation of his frustration. Xiao Bai accuses Guan and the Gu family of committing numerous secret crimes, emphasizing her supposed innocence. Guan attempts to defend herself but Xiao Bai interrupts her with a kick and accuses her of using manipulative tactics and seducing him. He claims that if she had stayed with Jiang Qin, his problems would have been far fewer. In an attempt to gain favor, Xiao Bai kneels before Hua and confesses that he was blinded by Guan's actions. He shifts blame onto the Gu family, stating that all the sins were committed by them, absolving the Xiao family of any involvement. Hua turns to Qin and inquires about his plans for dealing with Xiao Bai and Guan. Chen responds, expressing that mere retribution is insufficient. He aims for the complete eradication of both families from Qianchuan, ensuring their disappearance entirely. At the Gu family's home, Guanqi informs her father about the situation, and he becomes furious, seeing the attempt to scapegoat their family. He clarifies that all decisions were previously discussed between the two families, and now they are facing trouble. Guanqi expresses her surprise at Xia Bai's ruthlessness and assures her father that she won't let the matter go easily. Her father seeks her plan of action, and she reassures him that she has a strategy in mind. Meanwhile, at Xia Bai's villa, Xia Bai's father also reacts with anger upon learning about the situation. He is taken aback by the Hua family's swift actions to suppress them, leading to various businesses being affected to different extents. He fears that if this continues, it could lead to the downfall of Dingfeng Corporation. Xia Bai suggests to his father that they can only shift the blame to the Gu family to divert the Hua family's attention. He plans to spread rumors about the Gu family the next day to achieve this. His father agrees, acknowledging that it's their only option, hoping that by doing so, the Hua family will focus on the Gu family and give them some breathing space. However, his father's anger resurfaces as he blames Chen for their current situation, believing that if it weren't for him, they wouldn't be facing these difficulties. Xiao Bai assures his father to calm down, promising that once this incident is resolved, he will make Jiang Chen pay for his involvement. Next, Chen returns home to the Mu family villa and notices Shu Xue playing with her phone. He reassures her that they don't need to worry about the Qinxian Corporation's rumors because Xiao Bai and the Gu family are now facing their own troubles, which will divert public attention. However, Shu Xue seems sad and responds in a concerned tone, expressing her trust in Chen to handle the issues with Xiao Bai and the Gu family. But she informs him that the recent phone call was not related to those matters. Instead, it was about the Lin family from Jin Lin who is aggressively suppressing their jade business. Despite managing to solve part of the raw material shortage with the materials obtained last time, the Lin family's continued monopoly on the raw materials poses a significant challenge for their business. Chen responds to the news about the Lin family, expressing his annoyance that they haven't learned their lesson from the last encounter and are causing trouble again so soon. He assures Shu Xue that he has a plan to deal with the Lin family and asks her to focus on overseeing the company while he goes to Jin Lin. 
Shushua raises her concerns about the dangers of going to Jin Lin, reminding Chen of the past escape from that place. Chen playfully teases her, asking if she's worried about him. Shyly, she admits that as her husband, she feels the responsibility to protect him. Chen affectionately embraces her and promises to do whatever it takes to support her. He reassures her that the small Lin family cannot pose a threat to them and that he will return safely. Next, Chen infiltrates the Lin family stone gambling manor and places a spell on a raw stone bought by Jia Hao, setting up a trap for him. Later, in Jia Hao's office, he expresses his desire to increase the suppression of the Mu family as he feels tricked by them. Suddenly, a man reports that a top-grade Emperor Jade has been found in their stone gambling manor, worth at least 30 million. Jia Hao is delighted by the news and instructs his assistant to prepare the jade for auction, intending to make it the highlight of the night. Jia Hao plans to use the auction to restore the Lin family's reputation, especially after the embarrassment caused by the chicken bloodstone incident. He believes that the auction price of the Emperor Jade will reach at least 100 million, providing the Lin family with significant wealth. In his mind, this success will prove his family's superiority over the Mu family, and he looks forward to the downfall of Jiang Qin, the Mu family's head. At the auction, the bidding for the stone Jia Hao provided starts with 500,000, and the offers quickly escalate to 1 million, and then 3 million. Finally, bidder number 32 makes a bid of 5 million. Jia Hao, curious about the bidder, turns to see a gray-haired man holding the number board. Intrigued. Jia Hao stands and congratulates the man on winning the auction for the Emperor Jade. However, he asks if the man has the necessary cash to pay for it. Jia Hao notices that he hasn't seen this man in Jin Lin before and wonders about his identity. The man confidently responds, expressing that he can indeed pay and presents Jia Hao with a black card, a symbol of significant wealth and privilege. Surprised and realizing the man's status, Jia Hao quickly changes his tone, apologizing for his previous rudeness. The black card indicates that the man is a person of high status and financial means, making Jia Hao treat him with respect and courtesy. Jia Hao thinks about the man who won the auction, Realizing that the man's black card signifies immense wealth, capable of gathering billions of dollars within minutes. He feels fortunate to have such a rich buyer for the precious item. The man, on the other hand, is delighted to have acquired the stone, recognizing it as a spirit stone with a large amount of spiritual energy. Later, while sitting on his bed and holding the stone, the man reflects on how lucky he was to discover this powerful spirit stone before it could fall into the wrong hands. He plans to absorb its energy hoping it will help him ascend to the Anjin Realm Peak, a significant advancement in his spiritual cultivation. However, as he attempts to absorb the stone's energy, it unexpectedly explodes. Frustrated and angry, the man blames the Lin family for tampering with the stone, leading to the blast and causing his plans to go awry. At Jia Hao's home, his father praises him for his successful auction, as the two billion obtained from the Emperor Jade will help restore the Lin family's glory. Jia Hao, however, sees this as an opportunity to strengthen the Lin family and destroy the Mu family. He expresses his desire to kill Jiang Chen and make Mu Shishua beg in front of him. Suddenly, an unexpected guest arrives at the door, holding two men. This man accuses Jia Hao of tricking him with a fake spiritual stone and becomes enraged. Jia Hao's men warn him that the guest is a martial artist, and Jia Hao, feeling scared, tries to defuse the situation politely, claiming there must be a misunderstanding. However, the man is not convinced and grabs Jia Hao's neck, demanding a satisfactory explanation. Jia Hao's men try to intervene, but the man easily throws one of them into the wall, showing his martial prowess and determination to get answers. At Jia Hao's home, the situation escalates as Jia Hao's men threaten the man for hurting their young master. One of the men charges at the intruder, but to their surprise, the man proves to be more powerful. Despite this, Jia Hao stops his man from further attacking. The man reveals that he is from a grade D sect of the Martial Alliance, a powerful and influential organization. However, Jia Hao's father is not deterred and orders his men to kill him regardless of his affiliation. The men brutally beat the intruder, intending to kill him, but before dying, the man activates a spell to alert his sect of his death. This action terrifies the man with the beard, who realizes the severity of the consequences for killing a member of the Martial Alliance. One of the men asks Jia Hao's father, Master Huang, a question. In his place, the bearded man responds to his men's questions, dismissing their arrogance and ignorance. The man with beard explains that martial artists belong to the unified organization called the Wu Alliance, where all martial arts schools must register and be recognized. The Wu Alliance is divided into four major levels, A, B, C, and D, with D level being one of the lower tiers. The man who confronted the intruder arrogantly comments, Just a disciple of a D level sect. 
underestimating the significance of the Wu Alliance and the potential power of someone affiliated with it. The bearded man admonishes the ignorant man, explaining that a disciple can only qualify as a member of a D-level sect if they have achieved a certain level of proficiency in martial arts. The requirements include reaching at least the mid-stage of the Ming Jing level and the twelfth position of the highest combat mid-stage of the Hua Jing level. Realizing the potential danger they might face from the skilled martial artists they just killed, one of the men expresses concern about potential revenge. The bearded man decides that their best course of action is to shift the blame onto the Lin family, who were involved in the incident from the beginning. They plan to take the money and valuables from the Lin family before leaving. They start to take everything they can. After some time, two mysterious individuals arrive at the scene. The newcomers observe the destruction and comment on someone else beating them to the killing of the Lin family. The two individuals are revealed to be from the Divine Fist sect, seeking revenge for their junior brother, who was killed by Jia Hao's men. They arrive at the scene and find that not a single person, not even the dogs, survived the attack. They mourn the loss of their junior brother and vow to avenge him. The girl from the Divine Fist sect examines her junior brother's body and notes that he had four distinct qi energies on his body. She recognizes the qi of the three remaining culprits and declares that her Xinquan gang will hunt them down and seek justice for her junior brother. Meanwhile, Shishu watches the news and learns that the Lin family, known as Top Jade Tycoons in Jinling, was brutally murdered, and their ancestral mansion was destroyed by unknown assailants. The police suspect that it was a case of organized crime, but the true identity of the culprits remains a mystery. Shishua asks if Chen has done it. Chen denies taking full responsibility for the massive catastrophe that happened to the Lin family. He admits to leaving them with hidden danger, but he never intended for it to escalate to such a level. He suggests that the Lin family's unjust actions and their many enemies might have played a role in their downfall. Shishu agrees with Chen's assessment and acknowledges that the Lin family's unscrupulous wealth and behavior could have made them a target for revenge or blame. After their conversation, Chen gets ready to go to school. He tells Shishua that he'll see her later in the evening. However, deep down, Chin is looking forward to the confrontation between Xia Bai and Gu and Chi's associates. In this scene, Guan is feeling nervous and anxious as she plans to give Xia Bai a drink laced with a compromising video. Her intention is to destroy Xia Bai's family and help the Gu family escape trouble. However, her plans take a turn when Xia Bai and some men arrive at her hotel room. Guan gets frightened when she sees the men with Xia Bai at her door. She tries to resist their entry, but the bald man seems to take pleasure in seeing her struggle. Xiao Bai confronts Guan, expressing that he was aware of her ill intentions from the moment she invited him to the room. Despite knowing her true motives, he still came to give her a special gift. As the situation escalates, they try to force Guan while she pleads with them and Xiao Bai to let her go. Xiao Bai confronts Guan and opens the camera, revealing that he has evidence of her cheating on her date. He threatens to expose this information, which would lead to her downfall and leave her with nothing. Outside the hotel, Chin is waiting in his car and decides it's time to take action to clean up the situation. He calls a news channel, specifically the Qianchuan Express, and proposes the idea of an exclusive blockbuster story. He hints at the juicy details at the Royal Hotel that could make for a sensational news story.